Recorded live, high above planet Earth, inside an abandoned moon base, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Slaughter Film. Filthy Edibles, and welcome to another episode of the Slaughter Film Podcast. I am Corey, head cheese car, yeah. and I'm accompanied, as always, by Forrest, gas station barbecue tailor. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and with us again is our goth intern, Rhiannon, the Saw's family push check. All right. Okay. And uh, yeah. <laughs> we decided to make this one a special blowout episode, so we're all triple teaming one movie. We're talking about the Texas Chainsaw yeah. Massacre, a movie that we have avoided for ever since we started this podcast. Like, we've had we had a poster in our old set, and we've mentioned it multiple times, but we never actually gave it the full slaughter film treatment. Yeah, so which is surprising here we are. to yeah. me because it's such a classic, and yeah. it's one of those movies where, like, yeah, you can talk about Halloween, but there's a point where you have to stop. Right. Whereas <laughs> with like Texas Chainsaw, there's so much to be said, yeah. and there's a lot of uh, commentary about how things were and mm-hmm. stuff like that, and it's a, it's a. I think it's Polaroid one of those, for the time it came out and yep. stuff like that. Too. I think it's one of those things, and just that it's been so talked about, we just never got around to it. Kind of. Kind of. Yeah. Like, <laughs> we, but we not some... anymore. As you said, we're going to triple team it. Yeah. All of its orifices will be stuffed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> it's good to, you know, share uh, our thoughts on a classic. Of we'll, course. We'll make it a little sexy. Yes. <laughs> and what's more sexy than women eating roadside meat while sharp implements or something? So sexy. So, insert um, the word thrust somewhere and it'll sound okay. <laughs> but I think that my reasoning for wanting to do this one was, um, I've mentioned multiple times that I consider it like the best horror movie ever made. I, I, one time, this is a long time ago now, somebody asked us what our favorite horror films were. And that was yeah. the first thing that came to mind. I, I think it really is like a perfect horror film. But I never got to really articulate that. So now... Now we can, so. Yeah, and, like, I've always told people that aren't, like, necessarily into horror mm-hmm. who want to get into horror, mm-hmm. like, th- the first movie they always ask me about, what about that Texas Chainsaw movie? Oh, yeah. And I'm like, well, it depends on how you feel about certain things. Because yes. there's a lot going on in that movie. Yes. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll, I'll explain myself when we get to it, but <laughs> um, a lot of kids my age, they think they're cool because they've seen it. Oh, okay. And I'm like, okay. It's all right. Um, <laughs> things things don't change because it was the same when it, when it was my when I was that age that it was the movie that everybody watched when their parents weren't around or they were you know had yeah. some, had some friends spending the night or whatever and you wanted to watch something scary. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of like a rite of passage, I guess. So. Yeah, <laughs> definitely gained its uh, like new life in the rental era. Yes, mm-hmm. home video because it was banned on cable. It Forever was, and ever. Uh huh. It yeah. was part of the infamous video nasties. Yeah. Um, yeah. So through the eighties and the eighties and nineties, the only time you could see it is if you bought a copy, you know, mm-hmm. or if you rented it. Headed on over to the local video store. And yeah. Rented it. <laughs> Another thing too, like, isn't it still banned in a bunch of countries? Or am I? Yes. Okay. I, I think it's banned in Malaysia still. Um, I, I thought I was thinking like Malaysia or Singapore or something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. And like, if it was banned, it wasn't not banned until like the nineties. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it might still be banned, which is funny because, yeah, people, we, we were going to mention this, but people talk about how gruesome and horrifying and horrifically violent it is, but mm-hmm. not the case, but everyone already knows that, but it, it'll yeah. just be an interesting thing to discuss, you know, so, yeah. yep. But besides that, <laughs> this week has been something else. We showed Deep Red. That's true. That, that was, was such great. a good time. Yeah. <laughs> I think that a lot of people were really, like, on the movie's wavelength, you know, so. Yeah. Um, a lot of people were talking about how the soundtrack was one of the weirdest things they've ever witnessed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I was like, you're welcome. <laughs> um, I was I was telling a couple friends of mine, mm-hmm. well, ours, mm-hmm. that I have the soundtrack by itself. Yes. And my dad has never seen 
deep read, but he's oh, no. listened to the soundtrack with me. Okay. And he asked me what kind of movie it is. <laughs> and I was like, it's a horror movie. He's like, oh, I would have thought cop show. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, yeah. interesting. They're like disco right. western. Right. What? <laughs> but like, that's like in a weird way, like during the kills and things, like it works, like in the weirdest kind of way. Yeah. I think so. Um, so yeah. Goblin was in all my favorite bands. <laughs> and it's just like, it works. So one of these days, I'll have my dad sit down and watch Deep Red. Yeah, yeah. I know so. Suspiria bothered him a little bit, oh, so okay. I don't know how Deep Red will sit with him, but we'll oh. see. So yeah, afterwards, we had a discussion about what we might be showing next week, uh, or next or month. Next month. Yeah. Uh, my bad. Um, and we just sort of offhandedly mentioned Altered States, yeah. and the, the owners of the movie house, their eyes just lit up, so that that is such, such, I think they're really <laughs> digging that idea, so possibly, like, we, we, we're still, like, you know... Um, Again, you're welcome. Yeah, right. Yeah, we're <laughs> I never would have thought. Um, but I love that movie. So if they're down with showing it, I'm down with talking about it. So yeah, that's a movie I've only seen a handful of times, and oh, every yeah. time I see it, I'm just like, "This is the weirdest fucking shit." I love this. I was kind of obsessed with it in college. I watched it like every other week in college because it's like kind of the perfect college movie. Cause it's all about expanding your horizons, man, and opening your mind, turn into a monkey man. <laughs> <laughs> My sweatshirt, sweatshirt says college on it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, and like, right. and like it's, it's commentaries about drug use too. Like yes. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's definitely something. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, be prepared possibly for that. Um, mm -hmm. So any, anything else to add? Um, this, so this past weekend was pretty good for like yard sales and flea markets, and sometimes I mention that just random shit I find. Okay, <clears throat> and I came across uh, a whole bunch of wrestling DVDs for fifty cents, Ooh. and what really surprised me was the entire like Royal Rumble box set. Oh, nice! That goes from like eighty eight to two thousand and seven for fifty cents, and I'm like, okay, that's yeah, awesome. that's like four individual volumes that are sold normally. Right? Yeah. For 50 cents. Yeah, I know. I walked up and I'm like, so I see that all the wrestling stuff's 50 cents. This too? And the woman said, sure. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. So that was cool. That's that's, that's really cool. And at the flea market, uh, I picked up some Puppet Master. Just okay. because. Nice. Yay. And also, because my tastes are varied and complicated, <laughs> an unopened copy of the story of film. Ooh, oh. I love that. So nice. I got that for four bucks and I'm like, uh, yeah. That is great. That's a that's a great. Series. That's a that's a fine. Yeah, I'm happy for you. Which awesome. is funny because just recently I was looking online to buy it, like see where oh, yeah. it was available, what the price was, whatever. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll file that away in my brain, and then I just come across it in a box. That is so cool. It, that bucks. means it's fate that you have it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> sure. It was meant to be. <laughs> Um, other than that, I, earlier today, I saw the new Toy Story movie. Oh, nice. It kind of took a dark turn, uh, darker than I expected, when the main <laughs> character starts murdering people. <laughs> because mm -hmm. I actually saw Child's Play. <laughs> That's yeah. good. <laughs> um, I kind of liked it. I didn't love it. I felt like the visceral stuff that makes a good scary movie like scary mm -hmm. was sort of lacking. Okay. But the setup... Because it's not about a murderer who puts his soul in a doll anymore. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I thought it was pretty smart and a good way to update it. Right. So the doll is like AI. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought it was very funny and weird. Like the first thing you see is you're in uh, a Vietnamese sweatshop where yeah. these dolls are being manufactured. <laughs> and one guy gets yelled at his boss. So the, the last one he's assembling before quitting... He just like undoes all the safety shit. He switches the doll to evil. Yeah. <laughs> so he's like, "Fuck my boss! I hate my job." You know. That's and so that's the one that becomes Chucky. Yeah. Uh, but so like with Alexa and all this other shit, like our right. dependency on this type of technology and its integration in our day to day life, mm -hmm. which now this evil doll can like manipulate. I'm just right. like that's perfect for nowadays. Yeah, it seemed like a good uh, like Black Mirror episode. But right, then they also had the Child's Play property. Right, so they right. kind of married the two together. <laughs> um, but I don't love the look of Chucky. Yeah, I not... hate the way Chucky looks. Yeah. I've said it multiple times. I was one of the people who, when they announced what Chucky would look like, I was like, "This movie is gonna like yeah. it's gonna be shit." Because <laughs> like. I got into an argument with somebody in a <laughs> horror forum the other day because they're like, they're like, you need to understand that they're trying to update things. And I'm like, but you have to understand too that that's just poor design. 
Yeah. I think I just think it looks weird. It doesn't. Um, it, it, <laughs> well, there's even a scene that harkens back to uh, a deleted scene from Terminator 2, where the kid's using Chucky to uh, scare his mom's boyfriend. Oh, yeah? So, like, make a scary face, and it's just, like, uncomfortably <laughs> silly. Oh, my God. Which, so there is some humor in this movie, and yeah. that was one of the things. Because he's trying to do what little Andy is telling him to do, but, right. like, every face he makes is just uncomfortably weird. <laughs> That's what I heard, because I, just before I came here, I watched the Half in the Bag review of it. Yeah. I was like, ooh, this actually sounds kind of intriguing, because I had no interest in seeing it. But I was like, this sounds kind of cool, actually, yeah. so I might check it out. A, a friend of mine said he liked it a lot. Okay. And he is one of my, like, he's really into horror. So I was surprised right. to hear him say that because cool. he hated the original. <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> That's unusual. All right. <laughs> he is not a fan of the Chucky movies. Okay. And see, I love them. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't call myself a fan, but I'm fascinated by them. And just the sense that they're all written by the same guy. Yeah. yeah. So as ridiculous as they get, like, Chucky's interacting with John Waters and killing Britney Spears and <laughs> right, shit. Yeah. It's, like, it's, it's, still, it's something else. Yeah, it, it still has that, like, um, you know, wavelength or whatever, yeah. I guess, you know? <laughs> and, like, the thing is with Chucky, it's like, it's... It's like a nostalgic thing for me because mm-hmm. that was one of the first horror movies I sought out myself. Oh, yeah? When I was really little. And it scared the fuck out of me. <laughs> but I still watched it and it had enough of a of an impact on me mm-hmm. to, you know, as a young kid to be like, this is cool. Right. Like, and then for Christmas one year before I went to college, my mom and dad got me a stuffed Tiffany and a stuffed Chucky. <laughs> and I would just sit them like on my bed and my right. roommates would be like what the fuck and I'm just like listen didn't you know they're real I was like these are gifts they're stuffed it's right. fine and they're like are you sure they've always they, been they here. both came with knives oh that's good cool. well that's and, not you don't have to break up your set to you know to accommodate your your killer dolls <laughs> right you can keep all your knives in the knife floor. Yeah. so i have these life-size uh chucky and tiffany dolls and i always scare my roommates with them that's funny <laughs> i like to decorate my rooms with them but like i said like the original child's play like just the pacing of it mm-hmm. like that is definitely part of what makes it so you know special mm-hmm. and you know as a kid like that's fucking scary <laughs> like like the Twilight Zone episode, yeah. Oh, yeah, Talkie yeah. Tina, like that yeah. got me too. Right. I was never one of those kids who was afraid of like uh, reanimated dolls. No, I, that, that's something that never scared me either. But Cause... what really got me was that some like somebody's soul was in it. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's what got me, not the fact that it was like a creepy doll. I guess that could be my complaint for this. It's the the Chucky is sort of soulless. Yeah, that's what I heard. Because he's, just he's a piece so... of malfunctioning property. Well, that, does, but he's does he so... have a mouth on him? Yeah. Okay. Uh, sort of. He repeats things he hears, so I guess that counts. Oh. Okay. See, that's way the fuck. Different. It's not. It's not Brad Dourif. <laughs> right. See, right. That's that's another big reason why I, I feel like I'm not gonna like it is because I'm so used to that, yeah. like Chucky being, you know. <laughs> pun intended a little prick yeah right yeah you know like i love that and he feels real in those movies he doesn't he does. feel so real in this okay because mm-hmm. there's it's so cgi dependent it's you know kind of, like yeah. when there's there's like puppetry in the original and there's like a little person in a right, outfit yeah. or whatever right like you see those low angles of his feet moving in the right. original it's like you don't really see that in this huh and it kind of is less good because of it. Yeah, that kind of bums me out because the thing that the first thing that intrigued me about it was the fact that Mark Hamill was the voice of Chucky. Yeah, I just think of all like the, the great villain voices he does and everything. I was like, that would be really awesome. But I, if Chucky's not really a character in the, he feels um, his his voice acting. Yeah, I want to say it feels phoned in, but that's not accurate. I think it's more <laughs> they hired him because he's good at doing voices, especially right. maniacal. Right. Yeah. But I think he intentionally tried to not do anything too similar to like the Joker. Right. Or... That's what I was thinking. So then okay. it's just okay. Like it fits. Oh. I th- well, that's that's my problem because I think whatever he did fits the, this character. Right. But I wanted him to go crazy. Yeah. And following <laughs> Brad Dourif. <laughs> right. Just you know. go all out with it. Yeah. Oh man, that, 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 that kind of bums me out. <laughs> that was that was the thing that made me kind of like in a way change my mind about wanting to see it because I was like, oh, it's Mark Hamill, so it's gonna mm-hmm. be some really fucked up shit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 
that breaks my heart. Like, I wanted to hear Mark Hamill in that voice call someone a cunt or, yes. you, know. <laughs> right. you know what I mean? Just, like, go exactly. for it. Exactly. Like, oh, that, that, I'm disappointed. Oh, man. Damn it. <laughs> well, aside from that, so you said that you had some news, I Rihanna. do. I was scrolling through the internet, because I do that when I'm bored. Of course. Um, there is a Blu-ray release coming out of Lost Highway in America. Yes, Because there I wasn't did. one. Yes. But it does not have David Lynch's approval. No, and he said that uh, it's it's not what the fans are going to be expecting. He's like, he's, he's like, we're probably going to do it again. Yeah, he's unhappy with the transfer, <laughs> He's not happy okay. with any of it. That's weird. And I, re- I was reading that, and I'm just like... Should I buy yeah. it? Is that the last David Lynch film that was never released on Blu-ray? I think so. Okay, I was gonna say. Well, because even on Blu-ray, uh, probably, probably, probably. probably. Uh-huh. I know, I know. Um, Fire Walk with Me came out on Criterion. Yeah, that was pretty recent. Yep. Um, that Blue Velvet came out Blue on Criterion. Velvet, yeah, that's uh-huh. probably the most recent one. Right. Um, but yeah. Like Inland Empire, I don't think has a Blu-ray release here. Oh, that's right. No, it doesn't. So um, yeah. The one I have is an imprint, mm-hmm. or not an import. Yes, in, imprint. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I was watching Imprint, the episode of um, uh, Masters of Horror, because mm-hmm. one of the people at the Deep Red showing uh, reminded me about oh, it. Yeah, that's right. So that's I don't, cool. I don't remember his name, but he was cool. Yeah. Um, hey guy, keep cool. being cool. Yeah. Hey guy, <laughs> keep being but, cool. Because we talked about. Uh, Mike for a while. Mm-hmm. That's right. Um, but yeah, I ended up rewatching that, so I had imprint in my head. Okay. <laughs> but I meant to say import. Yeah. It's a Korean import, and I can't watch it. <laughs> right. Yeah, because it's region what three? <sighs> Something like Something that. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's like a novelty item I have. <laughs> it's it's there. All right. But I can't watch it. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I think that I might hold up on a, a lost highway Blu-ray just because. I, the DVD copy I have is sufficient. Yeah. It's just the movie, yeah. and the movie speaks for itself. And if it's going to get released again. Right. Yeah, and if David Lynch says he doesn't like it, then what's right. the point, you know? Right. So. so that was my piece of news, other than my intent to see the new Child's Play. <laughs> um, but I'm still on the fence about that. Yeah. Because, like I said, I've heard mixed things from people. Like, people loved it, mm-hmm. but the people who I've heard through Facebook and things that loved it aren't horror fans to begin with Mm -hmm. or they hated it because they're you know film snobs like us (laughs) all right so (laughs) you know there's there's a bit of a back and forth there (laughs) so I'm real I'm real you know I don't know if I want to see it or not (laughs) right right (laughs) I've heard things that I sorry I mean to cut you off I've heard things that are interesting to me, like, for instance, Mark Hamill being the voice of Chucky, mm-hmm. but the fact that it's, you know, it, like, it, the fact that it's updated is is interesting, but I don't think right. the way Corey was describing it makes me kind of feel like, oh, yeah. underwhelmed, even though I, I haven't seen it yet. I think part of it, too, I was fighting myself because, you know, there's a cast of children, and I'm like, oh, it's <laughs> kind of like Stranger Things. Yeah, that's, I heard and that, too. And then I'm too. like, well... <laughs> I mean, there's always been about like a kid in, or a kid and his friend or, you right. know, so it's like not really that different. Right. But I couldn't help but draw that comparison, especially <laughs> when I'm sitting in the theater and they fucking run that Stranger Things Coca-Cola oh, commercial. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Speaking of help. Stranger Things. Yeah. I'm so excited for season three. Cool. Yeah. Um, Just as a sidebar. Mm-hmm. Another thing, like you mentioned, you mentioned the cast. I th- I want, I'm a huge Parks and Rec fan. Uh huh. Oh so yes, Aubrey I was, Plaza. Yeah. I she I when I heard that she was playing the mom in Child's Play, mm-hmm. like the remake of Child's Play, I was like, that is a weird choice. <laughs> yeah, her, I heard she's her great humor. Is yeah, I've present heard in places and it works. And okay, uh, my only complaint is she isn't nude enough. Like, <laughs> <laughs> although Child's Play is not really a right. Yeah, there's not <laughs> like there's like there's jokes about it in you know Bride of Chucky and Seed of Chucky, yeah. but mm-hmm. it's not really like. There's no hardcore sex. Yeah. yeah. But no, that, that intrigued me the most because she's great and I think that she needs to be used in more movies because I don't think a, a movie has really used her. I mean, I haven't seen Ingrid Goes West, but aside that, like, she's so sarcastic. Like, everything she says... She's just, awkward. Yeah. She's sarcastic. Yeah. And, like, I love her for that. And ever since she, she hosted the Independent Spirit Awards this year and she, she kicked did. ass, which is funny to me because, you know, for, like, building up to the Oscars, it was, we have a host. Oh, we don't. 
We're gonna run without a host. Right. What the fuck are we doing? And then Aubrey Plaza just comes out of nowhere and hosts the Independent Spirit Awards and blows it out of the water. Yeah. It's like, why isn't she just hosting everything? So it, it had a horror like intro. Uh huh. It was great. Yeah. So <laughs> someone was like, "Hey, you want to be in a horror movie?" Yeah. You yeah practically, so, were already right. So, and like being an Aubrey Plaza fan myself, like I was like, "That's an interesting choice for her." And like after mm-hmm. like just hearing people say things, like she is the best part of that film. Yeah. Okay. I believe it. So. So. I might just. That might like like I said I'm really back and forth on it like certain things make me want to see it certain things don't right I, I might it's just like, see it it's for like that it's like an now. even split you know <laughs> okay so I'm real I'm real conflicted because <laughs> I generally don't like remakes right and I was happy enough to eat my words about the Suspiria one <laughs> there you so, go so <laughs> I'll give it a try <laughs> okay so any other news uh. Huh. Oh, okay. No, I guess so. <laughs> we, we can jump into the Texas Chainsaw the Texas Massacre. Fuck yeah. What happened was true. <laughs> the most bizarre and brutal series of crimes in America. Just as real. Just as close. Just as terrifying as being there. Even if one of them survives, what will be left? The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. After you stop screaming, you'll start talking about it. I'll kick things off. Yes, we're going to get into Sounds a lot of the good. making of this movie because the making of this film is so fascinating. It's, it's so. almost better than the film itself. Yeah. <laughs> so because do, a lot of shit happened. Mm-hmm. I'll do like a timeline sort of. And okay. then I know Forrest has some facts that will flesh that out. And I do, we'll yes. go from there. <laughs> so, the origin of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre lives pretty much in Wisconsin with the discovery of Ed Gain. Uh huh. Um, Gain was raised by a strict religious family. But the um, star of this family pretty much is his mother, who constantly reinforced the idea that women are filthy whores, all of them. Oh, God. <laughs> Which, what was that like? You know, right. little boy, all women are whores, except your mother, because, you know. Of course. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, what, <laughs> what, what, I don't know, whatever. Right. I, I don't really need to be on the, the, the fly on the wall of that home, but... <laughs> But yeah, all of them, and this is what Ed was raised to believe, mm-hmm. that all women were like some sort of enemy that were out to get him. And later in his life, after his father was gone and finally his mother passed, he was unable to cope with his loss, mm-hmm. and uh, he worked as a handyman as an adult who, you know, kept to himself. It's always, oh, he's a really quiet man. Yeah. He always all... kept to himself. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The thing about him is that he's considered to be a serial killer but he only killed two people yeah um well he did a lot of other weird he did a lot, stuff. Of, he did a lot of weird shit, shit. Yeah. <laughs> so this job allowed him to like travel and sort of get to know people and not to mention he lived in a rural area mm-hmm. so you know you could know a lot of people and be totally isolated i guess and uh this is how he would you know prey upon his victims and he would also take trips to the local cemetery by moonlight <laughs> where he would make victims of the dead, digging them up. Love and that. using them for whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then often taking it parts is, or whole, the whole bodies home. It is what you think. Yeah, yeah. probably. And uh, these body parts, as well as the cemetery parts, were used for Ed's macabre artwork. Yeah. It's what you call, uh, what is it, Americana? In, in, a weird, in a weird kind of way, it's actually beautiful. I don't Sorta. know what that says about me as a person but I've seen pictures and I'm like that's actually interesting 
I like how I like how the skin stretches around that. Oh yeah, thing. It, it's, the skin has a good stretch to it. Uh. I, I think it's weird coming from a vegetarian. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of neat to look at. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. It's yeah, it's fascinating. <laughs> um, but he would fashion, you know, furniture from bones and lampshades from skin. Yeah. Um, Belts yeah. from women's nipples. Oh yes, he had oh. whole yeah. nipple collections. He did, as uh, you know, well as other body parts. Speaking of the skin, um, friend of ours, Bork, he mm-hmm. his Dr. job Bork. or organ retrieval specialist. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes they take skin. Yes. And that got us on a conversation once that only recently we've discovered is a service that someone provides. You can will your tattoos to people. I'm gonna do that. I oh my decided. god! Really? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you can turn your tattoo. They what they do is they take your skin <laughs> off, right? And they p- take your tattoos off and they frame them and they look like art. Yeah, that like why leave so ashes wild. that are just gonna sit there? You could have like a part of that person, something also that they cared enough about yeah. to get tattooed. That like, is on your wild. Wall. I had it's, no idea. It's beautiful, right? Yeah. We talked about that for a while, That's and now insane. it's a thing. Yeah. So I should have got fucking in on the ground floor of that. <laughs> yeah, so right. when I die. Mm-hmm. Somebody whom I love very much is going to have my tattoo sleeves on their wall. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. That's, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Hmm. Death isn't scary, kids. And right. then when, when they die and their kids come to clean out their home with like all that stuff, they're like, what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's skin? <laughs> Gross. Um, but so, Ed... Not you know, aside from his little art projects and belts right. and what have you, he made skin skin masks and suits, uh, at least one out of a woman's body sure. that allowed him to dress up as a woman, complete with breasts and vagina. Mm-hmm. Nice. The thing is about Wisconsin, you got long cold winters. Yeah, right. <laughs> and once his mom died, he had no one to talk to. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you got have a to weird. make do with what you got. Right. right? Yeah. You, you wear a woman's body and you flirt with yourself in the mirror. I get it. <laughs> So not only did the discovery of Ed Gaines' handiwork make the papers and shock the public, but it also shocked and fascinated Robert Block, the author, Mm -hmm. a fellow Wisconsin resident, which I bet that was fucking weird for him. Yeah, right. (laughs) Who was inspired by the story of Ed Gein to write Psycho about a man who murders young women and Mm -hmm. is instructed by his deceased mother, whose corpse he keeps dressed and still sitting in his home. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, news outlets weren't as exploitative they were sort of <laughs> modest right and mm-hmm. uh didn't initially release all the details of what the police found in his home mm. like the nude body parts and what right. have you so the cross-dressing and the keeping of the dead mother was something block made up only later did he discover that that was in fact part of the true story wow that's weird that's wild yeah. and of course alfred hitchcock got involved and history was made with psycho mm-hmm. but now you've got two wisconsin guys thinking of the same stuff yeah. see i'm telling you those long cold winters <laughs> it's what it is yeah. it's, it's gotta be that <laughs> so now I, go ahead i was gonna say i come up with the best ideas for screenplays when i'm by myself snowed in yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> so now over a decade later a group of aspiring filmmakers and film students, film crew in Texas, set out to make a horror movie like no other horror movie. Mm-hmm. And uh, Toby Hooper, who's made several do- acclaimed documentaries before this, and one feature uh, called Eggshells about an I- idealistic hippies, I guess. Yeah. I haven't seen it yet. He, he but wanted I want to make to the it. Texas version of Easy Rider, basically. A movie that was going to, like, you know, really show the, the, the youth culture and the counterculture, and yeah. then nobody cared. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So with that, he realized that he needed to make a film that would be commercially appealing Mm -hmm. so that he could break into Hollywood, because that was his goal. Right. So this combined with the history of Ed Gain was the beginning of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Right. In sidebar, Easy Rider, I think it's funny, just recently I was working at a guy's house who had a motorcycle. Okay. And we were in his garage, and he... His his motorcycle was totally in the way, but he didn't (laughs) want to move it outside because it was raining. Oh, Makes sense. <sighs> Way to be a rebel. <laughs> oh, man, I'm going to throw my leathers. We're going to be out on the open road, free. We can go anywhere. Oh, it's raining. Let's not. Uh, <laughs> fucking pussies. Let's not go anywhere. Oh, fuck. <laughs> so, upon the completion of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, a distributor was found who turned out to have ties to the mob, uh-huh. oh, resulting boy. in Hooper and the rest of the cast and crew... Um, to receive virtually nothing for their return for all their hard work. Yeah, about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, I'll get into the, yeah. the nitty gritty of that. <laughs> and so, you know, it did really well in theaters, though, and mm-hmm. made a lot of money, which no one saw. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
But across the pond, things were a little different as the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was banned outright in England. Yes. Oh, yeah. And uh, their British film board wouldn't approve the film, and I thought this was interesting. They were unable to cite any specific scenes that could be cut to allow it to be approved. Yeah. Finding that the violent frenzy that the film, you know, takes on is just, it's too difficult. The whole thing is too shocking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is crazy because that's originally... that's something I'm going to get into. Yeah, yeah. Originally, Toby Hooper was shooting the movie hoping to get a PG rating. Yes, because he wanted enough young people to see it that it would sell as it many tickets as possible. definitely yeah. isn't. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, well, we'll mention that again, but... Yeah. Uh, they, I, I, I think the censors or the MPAA just saw the title and said nope because that title is so impactful. Like, yeah, well, got, every word like, like stabs you. you yeah, know? <laughs> and he even called the MPAA mm -hmm. and described certain scenes that they were about to film, and they were like, "What can I? I know you can't, you know, tell me specifics. Yeah, if I submitted the film, but what can I avoid to help get this passed? <laughs> so it was like no penetration of the meat hook, right? Yeah, no blood." Which there is some blood in the movie. There is a little bit, but... Um, everyone thinks they remember the, the meat time, hook scene differently. Yes. The one time the chainsaw cuts somebody is when it cuts Gunnar Hansen's leg. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's the it. only time you see a chainsaw actually that's cutting it. flesh. Yeah, that's true. And, <laughs> and I'm going to mention this now because it's in my head now. Uh -huh. That scene, like his scream is real. Yes. Because the uh, guard on yep. the chainsaw got too hot and it burned him. Mm -hmm. But he thought the chainsaw was cutting into him. Yes. Because it was what? It was a packet of blood and then a piece of meat, like a steak or something, and then a right. metal thing on his leg. And the chainsaw just cut through that packet of blood and meat and he's like, ah! immediately. <laughs> and then, yeah, heated up what the... What is uh, a chainsaw? <laughs> yeah, and then, and then heated up the metal on his leg. Uh -huh. And he felt that heat and thought it was the chainsaw cutting in. And then he, like, grabbed his leg... And squeezed the blood pack so like some blood squirted out. He thought it was his actual blood, and he freaked the fuck out. <laughs> yeah, that scene is in the film. Yep. <laughs> and that I that, I think that's a little interesting yeah, piece that's of a, trivia. That's a great trivia. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess uh, to follow that up, mm -hmm. as we kind of mentioned earlier with um, home video and renting, it gained like uh, another generation of fans, right? Which spawned sequels, and unfortunately. For the second film, the one that's sort of a comedy, yeah, uh, something very similar happened with the distribution of that um, and how Canon just, didn't want to give them any more money thank and you, so they recut Golan it. And Globus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I appreciate the the film that we get. So. Oh, Texas Chainsaw 2 is amazing. I, I wonder what it, it would be, but... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. And um, the third one is just okay, too. Right. Yeah. But the remakes don't do it justice at all. No. <laughs> like, there's been how many new yeah, I don't know. Texas they're Chainsaw all, movies? They're all soft, so it's... I don't really know. Yeah. There was a, a remake, and then... Was it a prequel, there's, or am I confusing it? I don't fucking know. And then no. there was just Chainsaw 3D, or whatever. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, because Gunnar Hansen, in a Q&A &A I was at, he mentioned that even the people that made the remake didn't, like, saw the, the first movie differently, because they told him... Here's what we're going to do. First of all, it's going to have an actual story and not just be a bloodbath like the original movie. Which And he's is... like, okay, first of all, way to insult the movie that I was in. <laughs> Second of it's all... It's not a bloodbath. Yeah, the, the remake is way bloodier than <laughs> the original. Yeah, the remake... And like, like I said earlier, I'm going to get into the gore aspects because that's my jam. But like... Mm -hmm. um, the fact that the film doesn't have a whole lot... Yeah. Of gore in it, but it's considered to be one of the most violent films ever made mm -hmm. is fucking fascinating. Yes. Yeah. And that's just, you know, great filmmaking right there. Like mm -hmm. that's that's people should study that. Oh, people absolutely. People should yeah. take that into account like what you can do, how you can tease the audience yeah. that much and make them freak out that bad when they're not actually seeing anything. Talk about getting like the most on your investment. Yeah. Uh -huh. As far as like yeah. a scene and a setup and a shock, mm -hmm. you know. Like all jokes aside, like that's impressive. Yeah. Especially for 1974. Yes. Yeah. 73, 74. So, yeah. It was made in 73, released, released in, in 74. 74. Yeah. 45 years uh, old. So. And <laughs> there was during the editing process, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, a different movie came out which at the top, top of my head I forget the name of it it was Warlock Moon no oh it was the one where that Kim Henkel was afraid because it was also a Hansel and Gretel story <laughs> no it's a cannibal movie oh it's a oh. witch cannibal movie but that uh, came out is it? something with flesh in the title hmm I rewatched the um, last drive in oh yeah episode it was it was a factoid that only half stuck apparently is from it, Bilbo is it Flesh Feast 
No. No, I didn't think so. Oh, no. All right. Let's all look it up. <laughs> you look but it anyway, up. Um, that panicked him. Uh, yeah. Toby Hooper. Mm-hmm. But fortunately... Uh, I'm not going to find it. Fuck it. Uh, <laughs> but fortunately... Like, it sort of just came and went. Yeah. I think more of the emphasis was on the witch stuff. Uh, I haven't seen the movie, but from the trailer, I did watch it. It seemed to be, in, like, instead of a blood sacrifice for witch powers, the consumption of people was a part of it. Right. Um, but, yeah, it didn't have the same lasting appeal. Right, yeah. And so, uh, Texas it's, Chainsaw caught all the, like, the, uh, the It's attention. all that title. Uh, in the, the, the book I'm going to reference, I'm referencing this right now, uh, I got a lot of my information from a book called Shock Value. Uh, which is about the horror movies from this era, you know, late 60s through the 70s and everything. Um, And Kim Henkel mentioned how they really got lucky with that title. Just the fact that they were, you know, a film crew from Texas, they call it the Texas Chainsaw. When you think of Texas, everything's bigger and bolder in Texas. Right, yeah. The stars are bright. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. Whatever the fucking song is. And uh, he said if if it was called the Iowa Chainsaw Massacre, nobody would give a shit. Probably not. So they they, they really lucked out with that title. Well, then, too, the North has a fear of the South. (laughs) Yeah. Especially back then. That would have worked better. in this movie. Yeah. Um, But, yeah, then Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. Like, Massacre, okay. Okay, a bunch of people die. Yeah. By hand of chainsaw, Jesus. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> the body count of this film is five. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's another thing. Not a lot of people die. No. <laughs> they all die, but yeah. <laughs> that's not a big number of people. Right. Like, right. Massacre yeah. suggests hundreds, right? Right, right. <laughs> it's only five people. So that title, it just really, you know? Yeah. 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 That's all I have. That's all? Okay, so I'll I'll jump right in with uh, some more of the nitty-gritty of the making of this film. Again, I got all my information from this book, Shock Value. And uh, much like um, Peter Biskin's Easy Riders and Raging Bulls, uh, it delves a lot into the gossip, Woo! which uh, <laughs> and there's also some juicy Spill gossip that in this. Tea. Um, he uh, fascinating. Uh, he he like, grabs your attention initially. He says that both the movie itself and the making of the movie are about a man chasing a young woman. And uh, in you know, um, in the sense of the movie, he's trying to kill her, and in the sense of the the making of the movie, he was trying to get her attention. But in both senses, they were chasing after the same woman, and that was Marilyn Burns because uh, she's fucking gorgeous. Though. Yes, she is. Because yeah. um, this film was uh, produced in part by a man named Bill Parsley, who was a member of the Texas Legislature's office, who decided to get into the private sector and um, start funding films because uh, a couple movies had been made in Texas at that time and he could see it as a way to get some you know, interesting tax revenue with, with uh, you know, independent film crews coming to different states. It was really benefiting some states a lot. Um, so he got into making these films, um, met up with Toby Hooper and Kim Henkel and saw their script originally called Head Cheese. Uh, first, uh. Thing, first thing he said was, we got to change that yeah. title. Another uh, working title was just Leatherface, too. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And then uh, second thing he said was they need to work on, you know, getting a part for his favorite starlet, a young woman named Marilyn Burns, who uh, was born in Erie, Pennsylvania. Got to mention was. that. Yep. She uh, was. Didn't spend much time here. Her family moved to Dallas uh, when she was very young. But still, I'm always going to point that out. But um, he met her when she was working as a waitress. Um and uh, she had been in a couple of like plays and movies here and there, but nothing too big. Um, he was immediately smitten by her. He claims up and down, because he was married at the time, that uh, their relationship was strictly platonic. Uh-huh. And that he just respected her as an actress. Right. But, uh, right. Um, but anyway, right. <laughs> he wanted her to be like kind of his star. You know, the, the, the Texas... Uh, troop of actors that she was going to be the starlet of it and everything so he started working making her um the main character in the texas chainsaw massacre um he decided that um the the funds were going to be split in half uh half of the funds uh, the not the funds but the um the profit of the movie half would go to toby hooper and the other half would go into Bill Parsley's um, production company that he just made, mm-hmm. of which he just made Marilyn Burns one of the members of, and the company was called MAB Productions, which is Marilyn Burns' initials. Oh my lord! <laughs> this guy had it bad. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it's it's kind of it's it's concerning. Yeah, how but, much. But literally, he just bankrolled this movie because he wanted to get her a starring role, and it was pretty much the first like story that we, he was approached about and everything. And he's like, "Yeah, do it. Just you know, make this girl that I have a thing for the big star yeah. of the film." Um, and we don't really know 
what exactly their you know business deal was and their relationship and everything. There's a lot of speculation here and there because she was a college student at the time and. Um, some people said that uh, after the movie was made, uh, Marilyn Burns came into her senior year of college with a, quote, maturation of the mammary glands that uh, he, might, he might have also paid for. Basically, oh she came back to this class with bigger tits. <laughs> but wow. um, uh, some of the people in like the University of, of Texas and um, some of like, the, the theater troupe and everything thought that it was a classic older producer, young starlet, yeah. giving her, you know, acting roles in exchange for uh, doing the deed. Uh, but there's e a even more interesting stuff in it. Because she was a member of his productions company and everything, she knew about a lot of his um, funding and everything. Yes. And there's a rumor that she might have asked for the main part of this movie, or else she would tell the press about his mishandling of state funds. <laughs> Which is nuts. Totally yeah. speculation, right. but... <laughs> See, I would Isn't lean, that wild? I would lean more towards that only because I've heard, um, at least from Joe Bob, mm -hmm. pointing out that she was so driven that in, in certain instances that seem big and other ones that seem small, she was very driven and like got a job at the restaurant because she knew those movie types met there. That's another thing. Yeah, it's and, possible. Uh, like, so like there was another movie she was in just as an extra mm -hmm. and there was a scene where, okay, all the extras, something's going to happen. You're all going to run away, run towards the direction of the camera. And she tried her hardest to outrun all the other girls <laughs> so she would be seen on camera. That's you know? great. Um, but it's funny that like it, it's this kind of like sordid story behind this movie because I think that she was perfectly cast in this film. She's I mean, so good in Yeah, I'll, I'll mention it more probably when you get into more of the nitty gritty of the film, but uh, I didn't know any of this stuff, but like that really struck a chord with me that this whole thing, you know, this whole like great horror film was made and bankrolled and funded mainly because some horny old guy liked to look at a hot college student. That's how every movie got made. <laughs> That's how every movie got made. But anyway... Like, uh, that, like that piece of information hits a little too close to home. Right, yeah. It's, it's just... I don't like that. Right. <laughs> I don't like that. But, but anyway, uh, Toby Hooper didn't give a shit how the movie was made because, like you said, he wanted to make it in Hollywood and this was going to be his, his big break. His hippie yeah. movie didn't work out, so now he's going to make this film. Um... Like George Romero, started out making industrial films. He made, you know, movies for med students, um, commercials, all basically anything they could shoot in their small Texas town. Yeah. Um, got interested in horror when he was filming um, somebody dying on the on the operating table. It was it was med, it was medical footage for med students. Uh, somebody had gotten shot in the head, like right above the right above the uh, right eye, I think. And the doctors were trying their best to save his life, but it wasn't work out. It wasn't. He was dying like right. on the table essentially. And Hooper uh, decided to zoom in on the wound as the doctors were working and everything. Uh, afterwards, he you know turned the camera and turned his footage and everything. Went to his friend's place and described very clinically what he had seen. Next day, he watched the footage that he shot and it made him sick to his stomach and he had to go vomit. And he said he was fascinated by how watching it on a screen made it more real than when he was actually there and that was what fascinated him in horror in the first place you know so. what I think that is because hmm. the second time while watching it on the screen you're only paying attention to what's on the screen but while yeah. he was filming it he was conscious of his zooming and all right. this other stuff so you're yeah. in the moment but you're sort of also somewhere else right yeah it's, it's very fascinating how that, how that sort of thing works so yeah anyway that was um, his kind of drive to make a horror film uh, like I said he um got the money from Bill Parsley's company, uh, went out into the loneliest roads in Texas in July and slash August of 1973. It's filmed in Austin, I believe. Yeah, it was out, outside Austin, yeah. yeah. Um, and just the most miserable movie shoot in, in the history of the world. Everybody was hot and uh, in bad spirits, and yeah. there were... You know, real animal bones and animal corpses all over the place that just stunk up the place so bad. Yeah. Um, and then for the big final scene, the the infamous dinner, the dinner scene, scene, yeah, shot all in one day because yeah, like twenty seven hours. Yeah, twenty seven so hours not one day. straight um, <laughs> of just 
whatever they could get before they ran out of time, essentially, yeah. you know, and everyone was miserable. Uh, Ed Neal, who plays the creepy hitchhiker, <laughs> was quoted as saying that shooting the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was the most miserable, uncomfortable experience of his entire life, and that includes his time spent in Vietnam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, said, yeah. I was going to mention that, too. Like, yeah. his, his performance, like, every time I watch it, like, I... It, his performance makes me sick. Yes. And, every every performance makes me sick in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, obviously that's the point. But, mm-hmm. like, the fact that he said that, like, that's fascinating to yeah. me. Yeah. Because so, of how into it he was right, and how, yeah. like, animalistic mm-hmm. and, like, really just primal he was in the film. Right, right. It's, it That blows my mind. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, this film was shot in, I think, 28 days, but they spent an entire year editing it. Yeah. Um, which is That's all Toby great Hooper. Because, yeah. It, it, it works. It, it's a movie that really comes together in editing. So, now they made it, and now all they needed was a distributor. They went to every Hollywood studio, got turned down by all of them outright. Just, I think the title freaked them out. Uh, yeah. The only one that even offered them a deal was Columbia Pictures, who then they saw the movie, and they said, no way. Um, so, they had to start turning to exploitation companies mm-hmm. and they found one a Bryanston Productions in New York City uh, <laughs> run by a guy named Louis Bucci Pereno who was a yep. member of a prominent mob family uh, he decided in the early 70s that they were going to branch off into making films because it was a pretty lucrative deal yeah. uh, they started by producing porn most famously they produced the most infamous uh, popular porno ever made Deep, Deep Throat. Throat yeah uh, that made a shitload of money like seriously Deep Throat was the second highest grossing movie of 1972 I'm first not surprised. was The Godfather I'm... and then it was Deep Throat <laughs> like this was the world that the, the, the early yeah. 70s war in filmmaking um, I'm not surprised by that at all yeah but the, uh, the... Butchie Butchie, yeah. Um, I guess at the time of striking that deal, mm-hmm. no one from, like, you know, Hooper and his crew knew that they were mob-connected? No, uh, Warren Scarron and uh, Ron Bozeman, or Bosman, they were the ones that had the meeting. Yeah. And they, they had heard, but they weren't 100% sure. Uh, I know I'm, I'm, you know, generalizing. Yeah. But if you meet an old-timey Italian guy in a suit, and he's got some middle name... <laughs> Butchie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The clamps, you know. Yeah, the clamps. But yeah. He's probably done whatever that is <laughs> to get to earn that nickname. Yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, after, after the success of Deep Throat and a couple other porn films that they had produced, they decided that Brian Stinn Pictures was going to take the next leap into feature filmmaking, which of course is exploitation horror films. That's that's the next step, step up from porn. Horror. Horror. <laughs> yeah. Porn, horror, exploitation. Yeah. Yes. Sexploitation is the combination of the two. Yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, the, the two producers, Warren Scarron and Ron Bozeman, they had a meeting in New York City. Uh, they said the meeting was weird right from the start. Uh, uh, yeah. Butchie Pereno was there with a couple of his buddies. Uh, they were sitting at a desk with just a, a whole spread of anti-pasto salad. Um, he was talking Ew. about yeah. He was talking about how he saw the movie and he, they, they all loved it, and they were going to talk about you know the numbers and everything. In the middle of that, some guy came in with a briefcase, opened it up for Butchie, and it was, they said it was just full of like diamond bracelets. Whoa! And he was gonna, yeah, and he was going to pick one for his wife for an anniversary gift. Uh, he picked one, and then the guy just closed the briefcase and walked off. No, no other comments or whatever. What the fuck? And yeah, Bozeman in an interview said he just wanted to get out of there as quickly as he could. Yeah. So they just kind of made a deal, and it wasn't the best deal in the world because, much like Deep Throat, after the movie was a big success, all of the money or most of the money went right to the mob. Yeah. It so. yeah. <laughs> will also, you know, they they're. Uh... The crew, by the time they had done, were done filming, were out of money. Yes. So a lot of the crew, in order to finish filming, agreed to take or be paid once they started to get money back from ticket sales. Right. Which is sometimes done on a small production. Right. The thing with working with the mob is <laughs> no one counts tickets... If you want to audit their books, you got to go through, guys. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. There's a lot of shit you got to do. So, so if they tell you um, from you know sitting inside their, their new Rolls Royce that, <laughs> oh, the film flopped and they only sold 10 tickets. Right, right. You're kind of not in a position to argue with them. Right, right. <laughs> like, 
you, you straight up can't. <laughs> Although it's it's I mean it's obviously sleazy, but every movie studio does the same thing. Because I've, I've heard yeah. the story that um, the writer of Forrest Gump, uh, he was. Uh, expected to get, I think, like a percentage of the profits if the movie made X amount of money over, like, right. more than its what budget it's or whatever. Yeah. And mm-hmm. the producers kept saying, oh, it didn't make that much money. It didn't make... And he finally had to call him and say, how is it not making any money? It was the most successful movie of the right. year. And they kept, it's because they kept, like, throwing more expenses into the marketing and production and everything to always keep the budget, like, just underneath because they didn't want to pay the guy because they're paying how is that? Well, that's the yeah. thing because that can't be cheaper than just paying him. I have no idea how it works. <laughs> you yeah, just spend it's... more money just to fuck that one guy over. Right. It's so <laughs> stupid. Like, But, yeah, I, again, like that, and that's just, like, respectable movie studios. Yeah. The mob is probably... So, yeah, <laughs> long story short, the only people that saw any money for it were the people at Bryanston Studios... Toby Hooper because he had his deal with Bill Parsley. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other actors and crew, like all the actors got a flat rate of $1,000 and that's pretty much all they saw for the entire movie. Um, and then Toby Hooper, who didn't really know about any of these deals and everything, uh, packed up and went to Hollywood. There was a little bit of bad blood with a lot of the different people that worked on the film and everything. Oh yeah, I can imagine. Like, yeah. yeah. And then as this book I, I'm referencing said, uh, then a strange thing happened for an exploitation horror film that was produced by a guy who just wanted to impress an actress and then funded through a mob-connected studio that specialized in porn films. Something weird happened with that. It kind of became respectable. Like, all of a sudden, it was shown at the Museum of Modern Art. It was like had a screening at the Cannes Film Festival. Mm-hmm. Uh, various critics started raving about it. Uh, Rex Reed loved it, which is weird because I don't agree with anything that Rex Reed has ever said. But I guess he's everyone's got one. Yeah. Um, Roger Ebert hated it, but he had to begrudgingly ad- admire the technical aspects of it. He said, "Quote." Um, it's a very good, very well-made film, and that's the problem. It's too well-made. <laughs> Which, right. I love those, those underhanded compliments, you know. Yeah, it's, like, I'm going to use that on my next date or whatever. Like, <laughs> did you know that Texas Chainsaw happened because Toby Hooper had a crush on this girl? Or not Toby Hooper. Um, or the Phil, Bill here. Parsley. Right, yeah. Bill Parsley. Sorry. <laughs> did you know that... The whole thing was based on this guy <laughs> yeah. loved this girl yep. so much. That's, that's all it was. Um, but then it became this great film. And and... It's really not about the chainsaw or the massacre. <laughs> It's just, you know, about a beautiful woman. It's about a beautiful woman. From Erie, Pennsylvania. <laughs> From Erie, he Pennsylvania. loved her. Who moved to Texas okay. for all, for whatever reason, to become an actress. <laughs> not Hollywood like you'd not expect. Yeah. But, um, but I think the reason that it became so respectable and, and well-loved is because of the the filmmaking aspects and, you know, the, the, the various ways that it's shot and edited, which I will move over to Rhiannon, who's going to do the third part of the making of this uh, (laughs) wonderfully strange movie. (laughs) Okay, so Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it's considered to be one of the most violent films ever made. Mm -hmm. But (laughs) Too violent for Britain. Too violent for Britain. Definitely too violent for Britain. (laughs) Well, there's not a whole lot of violence that you actually see. And that that comes into how they made the film. Mm -hmm. Like, with the, um, the atmosphere they used. Oh, yeah. Um, and the editing. Like, you never really see any gore. All of it is almost all of it. There is some. Mm-hmm. But not not as much as the title would suggest. Right. Which is fascinating because take the scene where... Uh, what's her name? Um, oh, shoot. Not Sally. No, the, the other Pam. girl I know who you're talking about. Yes. Pam. The, uh, the infamous meat hook scene. Right. Pam. You never see the meat hook. Pam? Her name's Pam. Pam. Okay. <laughs> right. Pam. Thank you. When you see Pam, when you see Gunnar Hansen lift Pam mm-hmm. onto the meat hook, you don't see the meat hook enter her. No. You can just hear her screams. It's, you know what happens because you know her what screaming happens changes. Because, yeah. Yes, because All, she goes from screaming to like gasping, and it's yeah, horrifying. Um, yeah, and that's because she. Yeah, again, right, this there... was a miserable production. <laughs> Everyone low, was in pain all budget, the time. Low There's... I have to find this piece of trivia that yeah. I found here. Cause <laughs> there's there's a piece of trivia about that. Yeah. Um. She was being held up from between her legs. Yeah, basically like a harness. In a harness. But not a harness. Even because though of she... cheap production. Like, yeah. <laughs> it was something that was built. Right, it was some sort of makeshift piece uh, of crap. Body stockings <laughs> and tampons 
<laughs> which were used for like the cushion for like to form like a seat. Oh my god! But yeah, poor Terry McMinn. Holy shit! Yeah, like yeah. as a woman, like I really feel for her. For right. This. <laughs> for her meat, her for her death on the meat meat hook. I don't know why that was so hard for me to say just there. <laughs> But she was actually held up by a nylon cord that went between her legs, which were padded with maxi pads. Yeah. Oh, my which, gosh. <laughs> that's awful. Yeah. <laughs> and despite the padding, it was painful. And she decided to use that pain to make her performance more <laughs> believable. Again, it works. It works because she's gasping like. <gasps> yeah. And I'm just like. She has a meat hook in her back. Right, right. Like, you don't see that happen, but her performance is what makes you think that that's what actually happened mm-hmm. to her. Also, a brilliant use of a shot of a bucket. Yes, I like, with again, the blood coming in the bucket. You don't see any blood, really, but you yeah. see that bucket and you automatically know what that bucket is you there You know for. what that bucket's for. Yeah. You don't see any blood go in it. Right. But, that, but the shot of the bucket, you know mm-hmm. that's what that's for. Right. And the scene with... Um, <laughs> the with Leatherface trying to get the grandfather to to clop Sally on oh, the no, head with yeah, a sledgehammer. Hammer. Yep. You know that she's gonna lose her head in the bucket. Right, right. <laughs> like you know that that's what that's for, and right. you only see a little bit of blood in that scene mm-hmm. when when like when it hits her that once. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And like, just this movie's fantastic. <laughs> so. Like I said, the fact that most of the violence in this film is never seen, it's implied, mm-hmm. that is what makes it so important to horror and not to, like, to cinema in general. Right, right. Um, Corey mentioned earlier that it was base, base, uh, based loosely on Ed Gein. Uh-huh. And, you know, not only is, like, the gore, <laughs> or lack thereof. Or lack thereof, right. It It's that it's all atmosphere it's yes. all um it's it's the performance of the actors yes. that makes you believe that they're being massacred right like that it's it's just the way that the the talent that these actors and actresses had mm-hmm. in this film and for these actors and actresses I don't think they. I can't think of any other movies. The other the a couple have of been them in. were in a few. I mean, Gunnar Hansen became yeah. the most famous, yes. obviously. Um, uh, Marilyn Burns, right after this, she was in was Helter in, Skelter. I know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, TV I knew that. series and yeah. also uh, Eat the Lies. Yes, Toby Hooper's next again. film. Yep. Yeah. With Robert England. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, but I'm happy you mentioned the style because um, a lot of people call this. Like even Wes Craven said that uh, it was like somebody stole a camera and just started murdering people uh, yeah. because uh, people comment that it's like very documentary style mm-hmm. and it is to an extent it's but... almost like i can see how it influenced a lot of the found footage yeah movies. but at the same time it's got a real style to it i mean that intro with the the flashes of light of the corpses and then it cuts to like the dripping like, dead sh- one yeah, yeah. And, and it cuts to like shots of like sunspots during the credits like it's almost surreal like, it's it's, it's awesome yeah and then when um when pam walks into the house it's got that low angle shot from underneath the um the swing the the the, the uh, porch swing or whatever yeah like that's all very stylized but then when the kills <laughs> happen that's when it gets like the documentary thing yeah. i mean the first kill kurt just kind of like stumbles into the house and leatherface just shows up yeah it's it's not like there's no yeah. like fanfare or anything he just shows up and whaps him over the head Pulls him in, slams the door shut, and it's like, oh, yeah. that just happened. Um, don't go somewhere you don't belong. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, like, poor Pam, uh, that great, again, like, it, it's all about um, just those little shots. Uh, when Pam almost gets away, they've got yeah. that shot outside, and she, like, just barely makes yeah. it out, and her face grabs her and pulls her back in. It's funny you mention that, because there's a piece of trivia I found. Terry McMinn strongly believes that her character, Pam, escaped from the freezer and made it out alive. Okay. As she thinks the character of Pam was a fighter. Okay. I respectfully disagree but i <laughs> i admire her optimism <laughs> i i don't think she made it yeah right but yeah like um the, the, again the way it's shot is, is yeah very stylized uh and again the editing is fantastic in this film but when it gets to the killings then all of a sudden it gets that very um cinema verite you know yeah. uh found footage almost looking thing like you said you know but yeah just a fascinating fascinating way it was filmed um and 
uh, amazingly performed. Uh, you mentioned that before that the, the the acting is just incredible in the film. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my like wild out there opinions of this film is that Marilyn Burns deserved an Oscar nomination yes, she does. for this film. She did. She definitely did. Uh, and it, you mentioned Wes Craven earlier. Yeah. Um, in the book that I'm reading from, I've read from it before, it's called The Mammoth Book of Slasher Movies mm-hmm. by Peter Normanton. Um, <laughs> Toby Hooper used Wes Craven's Last House on the Left as a bit of inspiration. Okay. Right. Um because that film had already demonstrated a bunch of violence and a bunch of like really fucked up shit. Mm-hmm. Even though Texas Chainsaw didn't have a lot of gore in it, that was an influence on it. That's really interesting because I find them very different. Like they're, they're, they're similar in the way they're filmed and everything, but they're very different stories. Yeah, they're, com- they're two completely different things. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll get more into that later. But I do want to talk about the acting in the film because... This, this film is just a complete descent into madness. The whole um, thing is absolutely nuts. Yeah. And like, as with many horror movies of the time, because horror was still up and coming at the time, mm-hmm. um, it was the subject of major concern for critics and that extent oh, yeah. to churches and governments. And like we said, it's still banned in some places yep. and some people are still really bothered by it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it was voted to be the second scariest movie of all time right after The Exorcist. Okay. I think it's way scarier than The Exorcist, but it's just me. Um, But I still consider it a fucking masterpiece. Yeah, but, um, yeah, you you just see these kids, these, like, young, you know, perky, carefree kids. They pick up a hitchhiker who turns out to be the worst hitchhiker in the history of the world, um, which is saying a lot. Uh, And I'm going to stop you right there for a second. (laughs) Okay. Poor Franklin... Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, well, well. oh my God. Poor Frank. We'll talk about Franklin. His legs would have worked if he just wanted him to. <laughs> I don't feel as bad knowing that he was kind if of If I like have any more fun outside. today, I don't think I'll be able to take it. Yeah. So, yeah, we get this hitchhiker who, yeah, just tortures them and does these horrible things. He tortures Franklin specifically yeah. because he knows he's disabled. Yeah, and then we go to this house that has a crazy giant bear of a man wearing a mask of human skin who's going to kill everybody with a chainsaw. One of them gets away, finds the friendly old barbecue guy, and then it turns out he is also a psychopath. Mm -hmm. And then it turns out all three of them are part of the same horrific inbred family. Like, what a nightmare. (laughs) Like, what a twist. Oh, thank God it's not the whole town. (laughs) Yeah, it's not the whole town. (laughs) Like, what a twist. Like, you do not expect that. And that's just awesome writing. That's mm -hmm. awesome, you know filmmaking in general like, like like I said like yes this is important to horror but it's important to cinema in yes. general but um, you really get that with the character of Sally Hardesty um, because you know spoilers for a movie that's 45 years old she's the one who escapes she's the final girl yeah but which is one of the first movies to have that I think I th- it probably was Deeper. but um, she is not the same person at all like um, we see her at the end and like she's crying but also like doing like a half she like, descends thing. into her own she's sort so of madness she's so crazy and that person will never be the same again yeah. and you look at it saying oh my god it's, it was it almost would have been more merciful just to let her die in a, in a way you know and it's horrible um, when I first saw it because this is my t- my way of thinking I thought it was a Vietnam allegory sending sending all these kids into just this like mad mad crazy slaughterhouse and then they come out and they're not the same anymore but yeah. oh well that's your problem now movie's over society. um and I, I, that's that that tagline who will survive and what will be left of them yeah again i'm not sure if vietnam was on mind but i feel like in these particular like era of movies vietnam yeah. was just on everybody's mind i think um, that shit really fucked a lot of people up yeah. Uh, a part of Toby Hooper's motivations, but I don't know that it was a part of his story. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. Like, it was an influence for him, but I don't know if it was... Well, I know that he wanted to make it, and it very much is, he wanted to make it about um, class class struggle, because we got this family who is, is kind of being you know pushed out by modernity, which is something that's you know even happening now. Like people feel isolated, and because they, they work at the slaughterhouse, but oh, now we've got this gun thing that can just do it automatically. Right. We don't need you guys with your sledgehammers anymore. So they're like, well, fuck you. We're gonna make our own slaughter fil- slaughterhouse business, and <laughs> we're gonna make our own barbecue. Oh, and surprise, it's made out of people. Um, interesting in that um, 
we get these young carefree kids and then this old like literally inbred family and there's sort of a clash and in a sense this is why I, I find the comparison the last house on the left weird because the characters in the last house on the left the villains you have no sympathy for them whatsoever they're just complete assholes and this one I don't want to say sympathy but especially Leatherface there is a kind of um um I guess I could say childlike sympathy. Childlike sense of like, wonder. Yeah, like a, a childlike naivety there. And I feel bad because yeah. he's also a, a victim and a victimizer. Um, Piggybacking off of that, uh, Gunnar Hansen actually studied children with that's true. Um, mental disabilities okay. in character for his role. Yeah. And I think, and coming back to the, the actors and actresses in this film. Yeah. I miss Gunnar Hansen. He was one of the coolest dudes I've ever met. Yeah, yeah. Um, the first person that was I actually like starstruck when I met because yeah. I didn't really know how to talk. He's, and <laughs> he's, like the thing, like I was like, I think like ten or eleven, mm-hmm. and I was like, I told him, "You're one of my heroes." Like I told this big guy, <laughs> yeah, this yeah, massive yeah. guy who was only cast because Toby Hooper said uh, he was the guy who filled the doorway <laughs> when he walked in for the audition. He was, he the was one. so cool. <laughs> he, He's so he was so cool. Yeah, he was Rest cool in guy. peace, Gunnar Hansen. Yeah, but yeah. not like having met him and hearing that piece of trivia, like that makes me think he himself deserved some sort of award for his performance sure. as Leatherface. Because yeah, he is the villain, but he's got a sympathy there to him is, because there is some sort of sympathy there because the, he he obviously has some sort of mental uh setback well and just the fact that he's being abused by his the yeah. rest of his family uh that's something else I, I didn't think about when i first saw it but watching it in um in retrospect now how like s- like sadistically funny the movie is because i guess hooper originally wanted to be kind of a a little bit of a like a satirical humorous yeah. Yeah. To it, it does have a bit of a bit of you know and it's kind of like um like uh, mocking of the classic like family sitcom structure or whatever yeah. with it. They're sort of like um, impromptu family. And the whole scene when the the uh, barbecue guy comes in. What, what do they call him? There's the hitchhiker, Leatherface. And I can't remember what, the, what his name the is. The cook? The cook, that's the right. Cook. Uh, comes in, complains about the door because Leatherface saw chainsaw through the did door. Did you see what he did to the door? Yeah, and then he asked... Look what your brother did to the door. Yeah, and then he asked Leatherface if like he got everybody. And Leatherface in his like child he can't talk he just like makes grunts and squeals and they made a note to that in the script yeah um when they were writing the script like they would say that leatherface would make grunts right like whatever and it would they would put notes saying this is what he meant to say yeah exactly but so he's saying that yeah he got everybody and the cook's like are you sure and he sort of pauses he's like well you damn fool you ruined the door and just starts beating <laughs> I was like he just was looking for an excuse to beat him yeah <laughs> there's a going back to your like class battle yeah right um I think also it has to do strangely with age uh-huh. yes because you have this this family that grew up in the rural or lived in the rural part of Texas, and they had their job at the slaughterhouse. Right. And now times have changed, and we've advanced beyond where they're necessary. Right, yeah. And it's like, well, what do you do with them? You just lay them off, you and just, then they're left to their and own, then you know? But then on the other hand, you have this group of, I don't know, 20-somethings? Right. Who are not living way out in the middle of nowhere. No. It, they're, they're, they are modern. They have been pampered somewhat mm-hmm. to not be able to handle the fuck in the middle of nowhere. Right, right. Killers, you know, coming after them. And it's kind of funny because horror movies, which before this were influenced heavily by, uh, like, science fiction. So you would have went to the adults, you, you army guys, your scientists, yeah. to stop the giant bugs or the invading spaceships. And now here, but now we're in the seventies, <laughs> and we're <laughs> these young people are left in a world, sort of the, the partially adults. ruined. It's like the upkeep hasn't been done on this house, and <laughs> right, it's falling right. apart. And so now the young people have to deal with it. Yeah. So kind of like what you were saying about Vietnam. Yeah. Now letting these people loose in you know America, you have these. Uh, I don't know, redneck family, right? That only were good to you for a certain amount for, of time. Yeah, one but particular now they, thing. They yeah. offer and they have no value to you. Now what? Now they're just they're just free left, to roam. They're just left to their own devices. Problem. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, and it, it, it's telling. Speaking of like, yeah, the people who they have no more use for. 
I love that, you know, the, the big patriarch of the family, Grandpa, is literally just like a living corpse. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah and it's funny you mention that, too. The family just won't die. They just won't die. <laughs> uh, John Dugan, who played the grandfather, is yeah. a piece of uh, trivia I found here on IMDb, mm-hmm. saying that after getting into the old age makeup, John Dugan decided he did not ever want to go through the process again, <laughs> meaning yeah. that all of the scenes with him had to be filmed in the same session before he could take the makeup off. Oh, that's right. That's why they filmed it all in one yes. day because um, they didn't want the makeup to crack or tear yeah. or whatever. Uh, it's by th- heavy looking. Yeah. By yeah. the way, yeah, everyone was miserable during that because again, it was a hundred degrees outside. But Gunnar then Hansen under- had to wear this thing for four weeks straight. Yeah. And it was dyed so he couldn't wash it. Right. And everybody was gross and disgusting. Nobody wanted to sit next to him. He right. told me this story when I met him. I know, but then, <laughs> but then, on, did he tell you? That, well, I'll, I'll get to the the thing he might have only told us. Um, so yeah, it's 100 degrees outside, under all the lights, it was probably, I think they said between 120 and 130 probably, degrees yeah. inside that thing. Everyone That's was miserable. Vile. Yeah, they, there was just animal bones everywhere that were stinking up the place. Well, and, and said, food, because they were sitting down and to eat dinner. And food that was rotting. It was literally like rotting as they were filming yeah. it. Um, and he said, so how did we get through this, you know, horrible 27 hours or whatever? And he saw someone in the crowd who was recording with a cam- like a camcorder. He said, can you turn that camera off? And he did. He's like, yeah, we were stoned out of our mind. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody brought in like a bag of pot and they just all went to town. <laughs> That's funny because John Larroquette, acor- yeah. uh, apparently his payment for doing the voiceover at the beginning was a joint. <laughs> Perfect. I love he was it. also instructed to do his best Orson Welles. Yes. <laughs> which I'll let you decide. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, let's let's talk about the the horrific dinner scene because it's really the the culmination of everything, and like um, that that is where everything falls like yeah. into complete utter madness. Yeah, but it's it's something that's both it, it's horrifying, but it's so horrifying that at some point it just kind of becomes a little bit funny because we've got this like bickering family, right? And Leatherface in what he called his, his pretty woman. Uh, costume he's got like the dress and the makeup all smeared all he's over his fun mask to play and in mortal Kombat. yeah and they're just all bickering but meanwhile we've got poor sally who's just losing her grip on it she essentially goes through i think all the stages of grief she does, uh, during this all at thing. once yeah all at once and at one point i i because like usually i'm not a psychopath like so many people are like oh you watch horror movies just to see people get killed no i, I watch them <laughs> because i want to see people escape it's it's, a, it's watching the, the the strong people get away and everything but in this one i didn't feel that i was just thinking just just kill her just end her suffering but then they give the hammer to fucking grandpa who can't yeah. even hold it and again it, it's like so horrifying that it becomes kind of sickly funny it watching is, this it is kind of comical like yeah. he's trying to he's trying to bash her fucking head in right mm-hmm. But he keeps dropping the fucking thing. Right, right. It's so funny. But, I feel like if there was political commentary, that's where it would be. Yeah. And I think that's maybe more appropriate now where we have like 75-year-old congressmen and shit. Like, <laughs> right, right. Get them the fuck out of there. They can't swing that fucking hammer. Goddamn. Yeah. But uh, the, the thing that shocked me the most, he finally, thank goodness, gets away and jumps out of that window. And it's like completely bright outside because yeah. we've been like so immersed in this like nightmare land we, we lost like sense of what time it even was you know <laughs> right. that, that's that might be the most shocking thing when she jumps out and it's bright light out um but yeah man marilyn burns again like knowing now that she was just cast because this guy had like a big thing for her is crazy to me because she's so incredible in the film um, and a lot of the blood that are on her clothes is gonna, actually hers i was gonna she say got hurt multiple yeah, times yeah, during shooting yeah constantly we're talking about we have this sort of like sick fascination with actors like ruining their bodies for a role like people who like gain or lose a lot of a, the blood a, you see is hers yeah so like people you got people who gain and lose like a ton of weight Tom for Hanks the, has diabetes Tom now. Hanks now has diabetes and all this stuff how come nobody was talking about Marilyn Burns like yeah like half of the cuts and bruises she has were fucking real yeah. because she was just running through like brambles and of course the most infamous scene when they cut her finger to feed blood to grandpa <laughs> and he's like it's sucking weird. on it yeah they, they, they had they had a knife with like a protective sleeve on it that was going to cut you know some uh and she's like no cut me for real yeah they, they were going to like cut off some tape that like had a tube but it wasn't working the tube like wasn't squirting out the blood <laughs> and then finally Gunnar Hansen just said fuck it took the protective thing off and just really cut her finger Jesus Christ, you know? <laughs> like, again, yeah. nobody should be hurt making a movie 
but I can't help but admire that kind of dedication. Yeah. Again. That, that that's my like sick fascination with this yeah, thing. Yeah, and like you know that reminds me of the actress who played. Um, oh fuck, what's her name? Pam. No, nope. <laughs> was it Pam? <laughs> <laughs> no, the woman who played the main killer in Audition. Oh, um, Ihishina. Yes. She, well, I think in English, that's pale. Yeah. <laughs> she insisted on puking for real yes. into that bucket. Oh, and the sickos on the internet masturbated yeah. furiously. <laughs> oh, method acting. But method anyway. Method acting is definitely something so else. So that, that, that's one of my um, long forgotten should have been nominated for some kind of an award <laughs> acting. Speaking of part. method acting, yep. the oh, film boy. is very much of its time. Oh, yeah. There's lots of talk of astrology at the beginning. Yeah. The alignments of the signs, and there's slang, and vegetarianism, which was yep. huge in the 70s. And, like, being as young as I was when I saw it the first time, that was one of the first movies like that that had that stuff in it. Yeah. I thought. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought you were going to say, speaking of method acting, the actor who played Franklin, I don't know if you oh, yeah. Hansen talked about yeah. this, he refused to get out of the wheelchair the entire time he, yeah. wanted, he wanted to live his character he, he, did, he was afraid yeah. he would lose him yeah if he stopped <laughs> and, portraying and him and everyone was so yes. annoyed yes. by him which I admire scene. that yeah. because Which that's like great. Jared Leto level yeah, method acting. Because poor Franklin is kind of like the odd man out. He's only there because he's Sally's brother, and like he's like everyone else is just so annoyed. But like that's that's a horrible. Everybody movie for me. gives him such a hard time, mm-hmm. and I said it before, and I'm gonna say it again. Poor Franklin. Yeah, like that's a horror movie for me right there. Going on a trip with people Nobody who you know hate you and don't want you to yeah. be around. <laughs> Well, Nobody that's... gives a shit about Franklin, and it breaks my heart every that's time. The thing again, going back to uh, the young people have sort of moved forward. Yeah, and I think that, in a way, who they are, if you want to interpret this movie different, is the justification to kill them. Because yeah. once the, I noticed this just today rewatching it. <laughs> once the uh, hitchhiker is kicked out of the ba- the van, and mm-hmm. he's rubbing his blood on the back right, of it. Yeah. It's He's so doing gross. that thing with his tongue, like <laughs> that Franklin later oh, does. Yeah, I think these city assholes push people to the limit to the point where they're ready to be killed. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay. <laughs> Coming back to the whole thing about mm-hmm. like the film being very much of its time, especially the vegetarianism. Thing. Yes, yeah. I've mentioned before that I'm a vegetarian myself. Right. When the hitchhiker talks about head cheese, yeah. ooh, yummy, yummy! <laughs> You'll love it. It's so good. Yep. He makes it real good, yeah. and I'm just like, you'd like it if you knew, if you didn't know it was in it, <laughs> <laughs> like hot dogs. And yeah. the, the, I believe it's Pam. She's like, can we please stop talking? Yeah, about this? yeah. And I'm like, I feel you. Yeah, Pam like, is definitely the most hippie-ish of the, of all the characters. Like, she, <laughs> and like Franklin's like, do you really believe in all that retrograde stuff? Yeah, and I'm just like. <laughs> but yeah, like the talk about head cheese and the way he mm-hmm. talks, it makes me writhe every single time I watch it. And like, it takes a lot to make me feel sick. But that's one of the few movies that I I can't like. Yeah. There's parts of that movie that I still can't handle. Yeah. Right. And it's the, it's just the way he describes it, where he melts down the fats, or that's how you do it. Whatever. That's and how you I'm make like, head it's cheese. It's so fucking disgusting. <laughs> it's and I think part of it is the way. I forget the actor's name who played the hitchhiker, but part of it is uh, because of Ed how Neal. he. Thank yeah. you. Yep. Part of it is because of how he sold that character. Yep. <laughs> it bothers the fuck out of me. He reminds me of an ex I had. Oh God, like, I feel bad for you. Wow, it's, it's bad. Because he drew inspiration from a nephew he has or had. Yeah. With uh, he was a paranoid schizophrenic. Oh really? So that's you dated that. That's wow! Right. I did. Interesting. I did. All um, right. Going back to the astrology. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the film begins with the, well, the introduction, the voiceover, and then the the opening credits, which in the back you're hearing a news broadcast. It sounds like it's on the radio, and the newscaster's talking about some contagion that's spreading and a bunch of other terrible like right. accidents and people dying naturally, or you know, it's just the news. Right. Because. This movie is a reflection of its time. Oh, very much. And people died in the war and drugs mm-hmm. and whatnot and uh, race-related issues. Um, and the, in the, the background, Manson family, that's, yeah. a, that's a big like factor in this. Yeah. And in the background, you have the sun and the solar flares. Of course, yes. it's like black and white, and then it's tinted red. It's so weird. Yeah. So you might watch it the first time and not realize what it is, but it's solar flares. Mm-hmm. And then later on, the whole astrology thing, right? With Mercury and retrograde. Yeah. <laughs> 
So that offers to me like a cosmic element because it isn't yeah. just. I, I I would understand if they cast a character in in uh, wrote her to be into that right, sort of yeah. new agey and right. But the fact the they have the son included at the beginning says to me that there's an intent to offer the audience a sort of explanation for why all this violence is happening. Right. Almost like something's something celestial. Wrong. Yeah, something we right. can't perceive. It's affecting us. Yeah. And, you know, because relatively, human beings have been on Earth for a short time. Right. Compared to how old the Earth is. Right, yeah. So, things the way they are aren't necessarily the, the way they will be. Right, yeah. So maybe, you know, <laughs> the world becoming crazy and everyone's killing each other maybe that's the direction we're headed and it's like out of our control <laughs> right you know individuals are doing it but it's like something outside our understanding is affecting us i like that because what i like about this movie is that it's almost like the way it shot it's almost like everything that happens is fated to happen there's nothing yeah. you can do to stop and, it and, and it's also like chaotic element yeah mm-hmm. uh pam's characters she mentions to franklin like franklin is going to like did you read Franklin's horoscope today? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, was he going to poop in his wheelchair again? Goddamn Franklin. <laughs> like, and I, like, every time I see that, I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, things are fated to happen yeah. in this movie. These people are not going to live. Nobody's safe. Right. And that that's sort of, like, what I take away from the movie totally. Um, because I've, I've mentioned, people have asked me, like, what makes a great horror movie to me? And there's, there's a lot of factors. But for me, the my favorite horror movies are the ones that just remind me of the inevitable of death <laughs> and that's what you get very much a Texas Chainsaw because again we've got these kids and you, and you can see it oh yeah like you can look at that you can look at that house and you can imagine how it would smell yeah right because yeah. like we, we, we've got these kids who I'm going to imagine lived a pretty like privileged carefree existence and by the end Peaceful, of it at the least yeah and by the end of it four of them are dead and the other one will never be the same again. Yeah. She's gone for good. Yeah, but for me, because <laughs> um, there's a lot of great imagery in that movie, but yeah, the, the, the there's two great images. One is the final shot of Sally driving off and Leatherface just swinging his chainsaw around like a madman, and then hard cut to black. It's yeah. like, you want you want some explanation, some like meaning for all this? Uh-uh. Fuck you, motherfucker. The movie's over. <laughs> you know? And Gunnar Hansen did it. that. Yes. Uh, yeah, as, I knew you were going to talk uh, about that. As a way to like say to toby hooper you were a dick to us yeah because directors are kind of maniacal I thought that assholes. was so fitting <laughs> too like that's the way that child man that leather faces would react to not succeeding yeah he's throwing like a temper tantrum yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. and but, her getting away too in the back of the truck laughing crazily because yeah. she just can't help herself uh in interviews marilyn burns said that she always wanted there to be a sequel where her character gets released from the mental institution, okay, and then sets out to seek revenge against the family. That would be interesting. That would have been like a unnecessarily but fun sequel. Yeah, and it's logical. Yeah, yes, okay. it's logical. She's but... better now, but how how sane is she? Yeah, um, <laughs> but my second or that, that's my that's my second favorite image. My favorite image is. Uh, Sally running through the brambles and Leatherface chasing her, and he's just gaining on her. And there's that one shot where it's, he's like inches behind her, and she is running as fast as she can, but at the same time screaming. Yeah. And to me, I think that the character knows that she's going to die, and there's nothing she can do to stop it. Yeah. That to that's me is like do. that's like the ultimate horror image. Like knowing that yeah. no matter what you do, he is going to get you. That's that's and like that's... something out of a nightmare. You know, yeah. <laughs> no matter how fast you run, he's gonna he's gonna catch up to you. You know, it's great. Um, and it's it's sad now when I think about it because. My favorite horror films are the ones that remind me of death, and now this one reminds me more so because so many of the people involved in it are now no longer with us. Yeah, I regret not getting Gutter Hits and Dr. Grant. I know, I'm really happy that I did. But yeah, like both the characters in that, or both the actors in that shot are no longer with us. You know, yeah. Toby Hooper's not here anymore. So uh, you know, just the, the passage of time just moves on, you know, and it, it's going to become more and more um, relevant and. Uh, sadness inducing the more times I watch it you know speaking of which um, I mentioned earlier how the adults from a previous era Mm -hmm. in one way or another sort of lived on to become the killers in this 70s era of horror films yeah yeah and then skip ahead 20 so years later and what do we have Scream Mm-hmm. Where the killers grew up watching these movies, and now they strive to be them. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean, right. like I think Scream is smart on its own for mm-hmm. a lot of reasons, but I think in the context of every generation of these films, 
like it follows perfectly in the next step. It's a good you point. I mean? Yeah. So nowadays, what would the horror movie be? <laughs> right. I don't know. <laughs> Kill yourself on YouTube. That's... Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Bully so, someone into killing themselves. That's what it. Oh would God, be. no! It's uh, it's uh, unfriended Which all that's, over. Yeah, again. that's not fun to watch. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, anything else to add? Yes. Okay. Um, so I want to talk about how big of an influence this film had oh, yeah, on absolutely. multiple that's true. different things yep. after yeah. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, for instance. Like, you have your classics, like Halloween. Sure. And you have, you know, what the works of Wes Craven and mm-hmm. Clive Barker and stuff like that. Like, sure. We wouldn't have a lot of the horror we have now without Texas Chainsaw. Yeah. Like, that is, like, specifically Texas Chainsaw is so important for these reasons because there was so much going on at the time it was made. Right. And there was so much going on to make it. Right. And there's, you know, like I said, the commentaries that you can look at and things like that. And the way they shot it, like, people still use those tactics to this day, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is fantastic. Yeah, but interesting also in that it sort of stands on its own because it's kind of like in the middle of like exploitation and a slasher movie yeah because like i said it's a it's a little more stylishly shot than like last house in the left or other movies from that era yeah but it's a lot more raw and down and dirty yes. than like halloween and like the, the really stylized that horror to me that says out. you have people who are really good at their craft you know behind the camera on the set but it's budget and this yeah thing, right and you know what i mean that's what helps it, it's not as polished or anything because well, we only have time to do a couple takes. <laughs> right, right. And, and we already ripped on the bomb, so... <laughs> and another thing that's fascinating about Texas Chainsaw is that it didn't influence just films either. Hmm? Like, the soundtrack isn't any isn't music at all, really. Yeah, it's like it's, ambient noise. Yeah, yeah, and you can hear influences with that, like with, with bands like Skinny Puppy. Mm-hmm. And a band that I... I love Skinny Puppy, but like one of my favorite bands, Ice Nine Kills... They came out like this. This album is like came out last October. It's okay. called The Silver Scream, and every one of their songs on this album is dedicated and based on of is based on a horror film. And That's one really of cool. them was Texas Chainsaw. That's nice. And the song awesome. is called Savages, and because of that song, a lot of people my age have been you know becoming mm-hmm. more interested in classic horror. Interesting. Which is beautiful to me. Yeah. <laughs> because. <laughs> You know, people say they like horror, but they mean like paranormal activity. Right, right, right. yeah. And I'm just like, no. <laughs> There's a whole world of it out there. No. Yeah, this movie still affects people. That's another thing. Like, yeah. um, when the song I met... is a banger, and it, the, like I said, the <laughs> film has seen a bit of a resurgence in people my age because of this album. Cool. And Ice Nine Kills as a band has been doing a lot to bring back the idea of classic horror and an interest in that kind of thing and filmmaking and writing and not and not just their music which is fascinating okay. cool. so texas chainsaw literally influenced pretty much everything that came after it <laughs> yeah to some degree yeah and i was gonna say it, it still affects people like when i met gunner hansen it was at one of the first eerie horror film festivals That's when yeah. I met bring him. it all back oh cool okay yeah. um and they had a screening of the movie and this is like my favorite watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre story. So yeah, that end scene of Leatherface just throwing his chainsaw dance or whatever. Because har- he was pissed at Toby Hooper. Yep. Yeah. Hard yeah. cut to black and like it was the theater was completely silent. I just heard someone behind me say, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. There's this TV show that my sister and I watched. It's 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 not on anymore. It's called Scream Queens. Oh yeah, that yeah. and there's a scene in the show where they're showing Texas Chainsaw in mm-hmm. like a classroom, and there's just a like a row of people just throwing up into their book bags, <laughs> and I think that's so funny because not a lot of grossness is in there other no. than the talk about oh God. Head Head cheese. cheese. Uh, <laughs> it's you, good. You'll like it. <laughs> you you mentioned the soundtrack, and uh, I know Toby Hooper. Uh, I forget with who, but uh, he was interested in experimental music. He was. So a lot of what okay. you hear is like the music made by toys or like just strange instruments. He right. Said, yeah. Like, I read somewhere that it was meant to sound like what you would hear in a slaughterhouse. Well, oh, you know. that's cool. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, like, also, it's not actual music at all. It's ambient. It's droney. Right. It's weird. And it works. The uh, opening scene with the graveyard. Ugh. And the... 
Okay, so I'm, I'm pointing out something that seems obvious. It's obvious to me because I've seen the movie a bunch of times. Yeah. But I figure someone listening will hear this and be like, oh, yeah, so I'm going <laughs> to say it. But even though I'm sure you two probably picked up on it. Right. So, like, it, it, the, just after the credits, you see the corpses on the, the tombstones. And leading up to, you hear that sound that's become iconic with Texas Chainsaw. Mm-hmm. And, like, the flashes of image. Yeah. The, so the sound of a camera going right. right. So that's just fucking like the person who dug up the bodies and created the art is just the hitchhiker. Right. He's got his camera. Yeah. <laughs> and also the sound is the photographs, but then also the charge of the um, flash building. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I'm sure someone didn't put two and two together only because <laughs> right. like that happened so early in the film, mm-hmm. and then the the uh, hitchhiker. So much is going on. You're not really focused on his camera. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I yeah. never. I always assume the pictures were like uh, the investigators or the police or whatever taken. That's what I thought. But no, at that first. makes it way creepier than it's. Yeah, yeah, it's just him. the hitchhiker he with his camera. He made the art and took the pictures Holy to take it home. Holy fuck! With you just blew my mind. <laughs> yeah, like that's what I thought at first, but after like a couple uh, watches, I was like, the hitchhiker took those pictures. Hmm, yeah, I never would have thought about that. That's really cool. And Franklin, my boy Franklin, <laughs> he he was like. Yeah, you know, this this picture didn't turn out so good. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's a good picture. You can pay me now. You can pay me now. Yeah. $2? <laughs> yeah. I feel like anyone would have just been bullied into paying and then, okay, you got to go now. Okay, yeah. I just... like, the, like their whole trip would have went totally different if they just gave him $2. Possibly. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. But like I said, this film has influenced me as a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. It's influenced multiple people. Mm-hmm in general, not just filmmakers or screenwriters or whoever. Yeah. This film is super, super important. And I'm not just saying that because I love it. Yeah. I'm saying that because it's true. Yeah. And like I said, it's influenced not just other films to come after it, but it's influenced pop culture. Yeah. In general. Um, like there's a lot of tropes in Texas Chainsaw that are still used today. Mm-hmm. And Texas Chainsaw is the first to use, maybe not the first, but, but one of the it's more there. prominent yeah. films to use tropes like that like the final girl right yeah or i think it's the first I at least yeah. it's the one that always it's... gets credit but if you dig deep there might be another but yeah yeah like um, the final girl or the killer um, wearing a mask the killer yeah. wearing a mask i mean like the giallo film some of them had like the the, the form-fitting like yeah. white mask but this is the first one where the mask like was the personality it right actual, yeah you know it was not just a disguise human. yeah like, that was leatherface yeah right right <laughs> and i feel like this is one of the first films where the killer has more than one face because Leatherface has... You, you see a, that more in the sequel. Yeah. You do. He's got three personalities he in this three. one. He has three. He has the pretty lady. The pretty lady. Oh, the, like the mother the one. The mother. And then the like the butcher. The butcher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is also maybe intentional, maybe unintentional. Like it might be a personality thing with him because he has well, other... That, but also matriarchy, patriarchy in this setup. Well, that's because a, the yeah. only woman is the dead grandmother. Yes, right. I was or a victim. Say, like, um, there was a, a feminist critic. I can't remember what her name was, but she mentioned that about how, like, since there's no women in this family, Leatherface has almost like become the de facto woman, and yeah. like, it's telling that he's the one who's treated the worst. Right. It's like, that's a also, really interesting, it's a really voyage. profound way to look at. Yeah. It. Whenever yeah. their mother was around, maybe that's how. She got treated before yeah. getting turned into barbecue. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> before they, you know, like ate her. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> I would love to see <laughs> <laughs> moments after, you know, uh, Marilyn Burns drives away in the back of the pickup truck. The mother shows up. She's just a stewardess. She just got home from work. She's what like, have you done? <laughs> <laughs> I leave this house to go work because your barbecue doesn't sell for shit. The house is a mess. What the fuck happened to the front door? <laughs> what did your brother do to the door? <laughs> oh, he oh, ruined another one of my dresses. That's great. <laughs> but yes, long story short, Texas Chainsaw is one of the most important movies ever made yep. in the history of anything ever. It's, it's what I call a perfect horror movie. It is a masterpiece. It's just a, a bunch of kids who never would have expected to go into this horribleness, experience and, the most horrible stuff imaginable, and then it ends. And yeah. No, no thing, message, no lesson, just it's over. <laughs> and like another thing that makes it fascinating is that it was made on only $60,000. Yes. Oh, you didn't mention that. Yes, sixty thousand dollars budget. It wasn't made on a lot of money. No. And look at how much money it made and still does make. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
it's a, a testament to how much you can achieve with so little. Yeah. Granted, a lot it's, of what makes this film work is its editing. Mm -hmm. But, like, this, the story is... It is a prime example of less is more. Yeah. There's barely any cases. story. There really is. There a is group of barely. kids go, they get together to go visit their own home, yep. which is barely a story. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what are they going to do there? I don't fucking know. They just go there. They're going to party. <laughs> and then they meet the wrong people. Yeah. That's it. That's it. That's the entire story. <laughs> Even yeah. how three of the characters die, it's the same. Yeah. They I, both I was, go knocking on the front door. <laughs> I, I was annoyed by that the first time I saw it because I was a dumb kid and didn't really get what the movie was trying to do. But it was like, there's no creative kills. Like, I wanted to see, you know, like the, right. the Friday the 13th type of thing. It's right. like, oh, yeah, it's not that kind of movie. Right. It's, it's not. <laughs> like, it gets grouped with movies like that. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's, it's its predecessor. It's, everything is much higher brow, I feel like, yeah. in yeah. Texas Chainsaw. Especially, just... like, like. Uh, Friday the 13th also took <laughs> right. yeah. influence from Texas Chainsaw. Right, you right. Can, it's kind of obvious. Right. That you mentioned high, higher brow. It's interesting. Like, the craft is high. Yeah. yeah. And, like, the acting and stuff. But, like, the subject matter and the people, the characters. Oh, yeah. Super low. Yeah. Super in the... <laughs> it's like the... a wonderful blend of the two. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that brings me back to my point where it's, it's a prime example of less is more filmmaking mm -hmm. like it really gives it it kind of forces the audience to make decisions for themselves mm -hmm. and i love that about it and that's why i love this movie so much is because certain people can make certain assumptions about the characters based on what on how they're portrayed and how they die and how right. you know leatherface attacks them or right Leatherface himself, like how he reacts in certain situations, mm -hmm. or his family, because obviously it's, he's it's kind of, it's Leatherface was abused. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Like, yep. <laughs> and so was I forget his name, the hitchhiker, yeah. his brother. Yeah. And I think it's cool. Like I didn't realize this until a couple of years ago, where Leatherface is part of a so is part of the Sawyer family. Yeah. A Sawyer is a person who uses a chainsaw. Oh. I didn't know that. Oh, why are you getting so smart on yeah, us? Yeah, why are you getting so smart on us? That's really I, cool. I, I do this for a living. I don't think I do That's that. That's my thing. But, so, yeah. Texas Chainsaw, I've said it multiple times today, super important. <laughs> yep, great movie. Super important. Um, I feel like I have to give it five stars because Definitely. I said it's the most perfect horror movie ever made. I'd so give it I'd... six stars if I could. <laughs> now the Matthew McConaughey one. What do you Ooh, mean? Uh. That's, that's like half. Yeah. Sorry. And the new so. and the newest one, it's just called Leatherface. Yeah. What the fuck was that? Oh, I keep forgetting that existed. I totally I, forgot that existed. I, I didn't I mind saw it. it. I rented it. I didn't like it. I might have yeah. liked it better than, say, the Matthew McConaughey one. Right. Right. <laughs> I see. I fall into this trap sometimes where I'm, I'm a fan of these movie monsters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. And like, when the new. Uh, Friday, the, when the newest Friday the 13th came out. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, when, whenever the newest one is going to come out. <laughs> oh, yeah. on IMDb, it's scheduled for 2020. Oh. No information about what it. What a surprise. So it's not happening. <laughs> yeah. because but, I mentioned that because I'm excited to see like, right. how, like, what the kills are going to be. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like, if they're interesting, if they're cool, how gory they are. Right. If I hate the person that's dying, because <laughs> usually, like, you can... <laughs> Me and my mom have this thing where we can pick off who's going to die first. <laughs> right. Um, you know, horror movie tropes. Sure. Yeah, sure. And Leatherface, the newest film, like, I was very underwhelmed by it because I felt like I had seen everything before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I like that there was a misdirection. Sometimes. I like that there was a misdirection with who Leatherface was going to be. Because mm -hmm. it sort of set it up like, oh, it's going to be that kid. He's going to become... But then I just gave it away. It's someone else. Oh, okay. <laughs> there, was, there was a little bit of a I like was. a yeah. little bit of a purposeful misdirection. Right. There. Yeah. So I I do give it credit for that. Okay. But you know, like I said, none of the remakes and the remake sequels or the prequels right. or whatever do the original justice at all. Right. Texas Chainsaw, the movie that got made just because a Texas legislature had a crush on an aspiring actress <laughs> and a mob-run company wanted to branch off from porn. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so seriously they... going to use that on my next date. <laughs> yeah. so hey, they baby, let, did so you they know? So they let a uh, madman director hungry for Hollywood yeah. <laughs> smoke all the pot he could <laughs> in a 120-degree house filled with rotting flesh. Like, uh, like, and now uh, we have Rob Zombie. Yeah. <laughs> And that's how Rob Zombie was born. <laughs> Speaking of 
love Rob Zombie. I'm still trying to get tickets to see him and Marilyn Manson together. Oh, on yeah. Tour. How's Manson been doing? He... He had, like, a breakdown a while ago. He did. Oh, really? Um, apparently, yeah. I think he's okay now. Okay. I know he still does drugs. Oh. But... Okay. <laughs> I feel like when you reach a certain age, you should just cut back on you that sort of kind thing. kind of stop doing drugs. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, like, like, I mentioned a few, like... A while ago, like a couple months ago, now mm. like his feud with Trent Reznor, I yeah. guess they they made up oh. or something. Okay. So I guess that's good now. The three should tour together they in should. a '90s extravaganza. <laughs> yeah, right. Rob Zombie, Marilyn Manson, yeah. Nine Inch Nails, and I and like if that were to happen, you'd know I'd give it my life savings. And then, and then they, you could have Fred Durst in a dunk tank. <laughs> See, that's fantastic. <laughs> I I would give my life for that. You know, I I really don't like growing Lipiscuit. up. Like when Faith came out, I'm yeah. like, oh, it's not my cup of tea. But you know, but, rap metal, it? that's kind of yeah. fun. It's kind of neat. But then I got tired of it real quick. I don't like <laughs> and I fucking Lipiscuit that much. Hated them and him. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. now, like after all this time has passed, I sort of feel bad because he probably gets shit on all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Like he's just I'm, a guy with right, a hat, right. you know. I mean, he likes the New York Yankees. We can leave him be. Right. <laughs> but yeah, like I bring that up because, you know, Rob Zombie took a lot of influence from Texas Chainsaw. Again, mm-hmm. yeah. Texas Chainsaw influenced everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's also fortunate that we're talking about this because any day now, I forget when the date is. Three his, from Hell. Uh, yeah, Three from Hell mm-hmm. comes out. Oh, okay. by the way, so the trailer excited. was bullshit. Yeah, it was. It's just a teaser trailer. It doesn't show you shit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that the three of us are going to make a trip to go. Sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Already watched the first two. Yeah. Yep. Uh, this is like, it's weird because this is the first Rob Zombie movie in a little while that I've been excited, excited yeah, for. Yeah. Right. Um, I've been right. excited for him ever since um, the second Halloween came out because okay. I. Again, I'm not a fan of remakes, but I do like pieces of the Halloween remakes. Okay. Yeah. I like how you see, again, like I'm obsessed with movie monsters and the psychology behind <laughs> right, them. Right, yeah. The I don't... psychology of like serial killers and stuff like that. You right. get to see how Michael Myers became to be as fucked up as he right, is. Right, right. And I think that's cool how, he, how Rob Zombie was able to do that. I... I have complicated feelings. About that. <laughs> yeah. I like that that was included. I like that because it was it was if he was going to do a remake, I like that I he did something cool. different. Yeah, I think it's cool that he added something different to it. But, but upon, there are pieces about it that are uh, if like, if he upon rewatching it, like after the DVD came out, mm-hmm. I was <laughs> I'm just like waiting for him to be an adult. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in hindsight, I'm like that would have been an awesome like short film, right? As a special feature as opposed to a whole. But I it's still I like that he <laughs> I like that he did something different with a remake. Sure, he you know otherwise it's the same thing. And why? Yeah, he, he kind he of was, was painted into a corner with that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> he was able to breathe some new life into something yeah. so mm-hmm. iconic, and you know the <laughs> the sequels in that series aren't good yeah. either. Right, but. Uh, uh, Lords of Salem, I liked a lot. Oh, the ending, yes. I'm a little weak on them. I, uh, I like, 31, I thought was okay. Yeah. So now this third, Three I, from yeah, Hell, I'm, I'm like, fucking A, let's do it. Three from Hell is like. Right. But yeah. So now that we went on a tangent. I went on a tangent. On an episode that was an entirely tangent because we didn't do any of the synopsis, but you've seen the movie. You've seen the movie. I think, <laughs> I think it was a, more fun to do the synopsis. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a famous enough movie. And like our viewers, like you our viewers see, yeah. or listeners or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Like, so if you were struggling this whole time, uh, a group of kids get in a van and drive across Texas to go to an old house that's fallen apart and infested with spiders. Yep. And then they're like, wait, we're low on gas. We'll go to this house next door. And uh oh, a leather face killed us one by one. <laughs> One of them's in a wheelchair. And Leatherface. He meaning... cannot outrun Leatherface. Let me no. tell you that. Right. <laughs> Leatherface is a guy who wears human skin on his face yeah. as a mask. Yeah. Yeah. So that was all the setup with Ed Gein. You know. Yeah. Yeah. That guy. Oh, we mentioned. That I started and he has that. Three different I know, ones. but that's why. Yeah, yeah. If you hadn't seen it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. But anyway, so, yeah. All the all the stars. All the stars. All of them. <laughs> all of them. So. Uh, Forrest gave it a five. Uh huh. Raiden gave it a six. <laughs> I'll give it a four only so that it balances back out to five. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, All right. yeah, so 
Yeah. If anyone Texas else has Chainsaw. like a crackpot theory, like yeah, mine, I tried to fill it with crackpot theories. I uh, know. I love your. It was all about theories. space they, and they were great. <laughs> there's some there's some cosmic whatever in yeah. there. Galactus. <laughs> yeah. Galactus whatever. is Leatherface, guys. Whoa. Oh my so, lord. Galactus is Leatherface, guys. <laughs> oh, uh, we, we could do trivia. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, last week's question was Yes. What 1960s Herschel Gordon Lewis directed movie follows the exploits of a Chicago garage band being ripped off by their sleazy promoter? I don't remember. Uh, I have to look up the title. <laughs> You're oh, cheating. You've seen it, though? <laughs> I have. Well, I'm going to say it anyway. Okay, go ahead. The Blast Off Girls. Yep. <laughs> I love that. Which I title. guess predated Pussycat Doll or I'm, Girl. Uh, what's the one that's a real band and not just singing and dancing and abs? Pussycat Kill Kill? No, the, the girl band. I've been drinking, by the way. I figured this was episode Pussy 365. No. <laughs> uh, no, it was a, a cartoon, a Hanna Barbera cartoon. Oh, into a Josie movie. and the Pussycats. That's the one. Yeah. I was, like, I was, what are you talking I was, about? I was like Riot Punk, like yeah. feminist punk. What? <laughs> so it's Josie and the Pussycats, but in the 60s with Herschel Gordon Lewis. I love it. <laughs> I was, was going to say Gore Gore Girls, so I was wrong anyway. Ah, uh, darn. <laughs> yes. Gore Gore Girls has one of the strangest things I've ever seen in a movie. Nipple scissoring, yeah. and then milk into a glass, where the killer, wearing giallo leather gloves, <laughs> clinks two glasses together. I think he's alone. He's I don't know. himself. <laughs> yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> that is... Like, it's like the saddest thing ever. I remember watching that either with you or Bork, and that scene happened, and I'm like, what was, what just happened? There's a lot of that in Herschel Gordon Lewis's yeah. movies, yeah. right? Like, a scene happens, and you're like, what? So this week's question, we'll never have an answer. We'll never have so an I'm answer. So I'm not going to... I shouldn't say never, but I, I didn't plan to ask one because... It's okay, yeah. Next yeah. week... Next, we're like, on vacation. We're going to be on a vacation, yeah. and yeah, we're like I said, we are did 365 episodes, so you guys can watch one episode a day for the rest of the year, <laughs> and never yeah. have to watch another one twice. Um, so yeah, we're going on a little bit of a break. Like we said, it's not not the end of Slaughter Film, not even the end of the podcast, but just for a little while. We got to hold up on the yeah. doing it every single week. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> every I don't know summer, usually around. My birthday, which is approaching, is yeah. It's towards the end of uh, the month, it's and two days away. Fuck yeah! yeah. And, uh, Happy birthday! <laughs> like with with our usual vacation trip to uh, Michigan. Yeah, there's usually a moment, probably on a Friday. I'm leaving work. I have my check in my pocket, <laughs> and I this feeling overcomes me, especially if the weather's nice. Oh man, remember what summer vacation was like when you were a kid? You just <laughs> yeah. like wake up and play video games all day. <laughs> yeah, I get that feeling, and I won't lie, because I mean, obviously it sucks for you listeners, but like I've had that feeling this past week. I'm like, yeah. oh my god, what am I going to do next week? Fucking nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go to the beach and like read a book, or you know, if the weather's nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna fucking so. do nothing. It's going to feel good. So yeah. as you can tell, we 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 need a little bit of a break from this. Yeah. And- and homegirl over here is yeah, trying to graduate. New, new job yeah. at school. Right, yeah. right. So, so she she's got a lot going on. I assume too. She writes for her school newspaper. Nice. That's good. So she it. needs to work on that. Forrest yep. writes for the school newspaper. I do write for the school newspaper. <laughs> Speaking uh, of writing at all, I yeah. need to catch up on my uh, reviews, my written reviews. Oh yeah. I have a plethora that I need to put up on the site. Mm-hmm. I I need to go back and listen to. The previous podcast to remember which ones I promised because I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I, yeah. Be prepared for that. More written reviews still, obviously. Uh, yeah, we all more videos. Like we we shot a couple shot, of videos. Yeah. Stuff, so you and know. we all know each other, so we'll be talking about what to do in the all future. the time. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we know each other. We do. Yeah. We're not just strangers. We're not just yeah. assholes that show up randomly and just we didn't yeah. like <laughs> meet at a, a highway rest stop in the men's room. <laughs> Like some senator that they now have to deep cut. No one remembers that, but... Yeah. It's time for comments. You've got mail. The Slaughter Film crew love getting feedback, and there are three ways to leave your unique, strange, and quite frankly, a little disturbing questions and comments. First, at the website slaughterfilm.com. Second, Email the show at slaughterfilm at hotmail.com. 
And last but not least, call the Slaughter Film Hotline and leave a message by dialing 1-814-636-1378. So comments? Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's, let's get those yeah, comments. Yeah, let's get there. We got a couple. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, Blake says, I lament the hiatus that you will be going on, um, but I also understand that your lives don't revolve around this filthy animal. <laughs> <laughs> That said, I'm going to do a, quote, headcanon and pretend that the reason for the hiatus is none other than that lazy, no-good son-of-a-bitch Eric Roberts. (laughs) Yes! He must have done something. Blame it all on him. (laughs) There's actually a containment leak on uh, our our moon base, so there's a lot of radiation and... uh, I don't know, whatever Harrison Ford said before blowing up the console. Right. Large leak, very dangerous. Yeah, yeah. That was a boring conversation anyway. Uh, then LL Cool Josh on YouTube. I love yeah. that name. Love it so much. It says, oh man, I was hoping for Tintorera. Killer Shark reviewed this summer. And according oh. to IMDb, that's a 1977 film about two shark hunters... I love how IMDb is like sometimes user curated. Because yeah. yeah. this description does not sound like a professional wrote it. <laughs> Two shark hunters flirt with an attractive British lady while hunting down a large tiger shark terrorizing the Mexican East Coast. <laughs> so she's just some random British woman who happens to be near Mexico. <laughs> it sounds well, fantastic. Maybe I'll check that out and, and do something for it. Because, we'll yeah, pop, we'll we got to have at least one shark review for the summer. Sure. So I, I might, you know, either write something or maybe shoot a video on it or something sure. like it's that. Funny, you know? It's funny you it's funny you mention sharks, LL Cool Josh. Yeah. Because my mom and I, we collect shitty horror movies. <laughs> or shitty shark movies specifically. Right, yeah. And uh, we have a plethora of ones that we both collectively hate, but we love them <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. Avalanche uh. sharks. Do you have, have shark you s- exorcists? I think we do. <laughs> have you seen uh, Mako? The Jaws of Death. Jaws of Death. Yeah. I, I, we have that one. He talks to the shark. He does. <laughs> and I thought it was going to be like, it's about him. He owns a medallion that allows him to communicate with the sharks. And I thought it was going to be telepathically. <laughs> no. He just speaks to them. Yeah. So it's like, hey, Bruce, how's your wife? <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, that, that movie is definitely something. It is. Yeah. And I remember watching an episode of Angry Video Game Nerd where he talks about oh, like the, um, the all of the top. shitty shark movies. Yeah, yeah. and My then mom... he, he made a second video that was an addendum, so there were more added. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my mom probably owns like more than half of those. <clears throat> Wow. <laughs> she's, she's really into sea life, and shitty shark movies are her favorite. Well, I understand. Awesome. Like, I know you've mentioned in the past she's like uh, really likes Jaws. She does. Mm-hmm. That's her favorite. But you would think favorite. with the sheer amount of shitty shark movies, <laughs> she just would have thrown in the towel or something. <laughs> yeah, right. She, right. <laughs> like, this is like, getting silly. <laughs> sea life is her thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, she, like, our bathroom at our house is all sea life. And okay. there's, she has this, she has shark like decorations in there Mm -hmm. it's it's her thing it's her favorite thing kind of like how blood and guts is mine (laughs) right sharks are hers you could each swim in both if you (laughs) try hard enough yeah but yeah my mom is super into sharks yeah that's like her favorite thing and it it always works out because every time sharknado is on we gotta watch it (laughs) right all five is there five now there's There's six six Six. damn it (laughs) yep they pulled the plug after the sixth yeah i don't know how you top it it's Uh, well (laughs) is it called the sixth one it's called sharknado six it's about time yeah (laughs) and also the sixth one. Oh, that's the last one. Oh, well, it's about time. Yeah, that too. Yeah. <laughs> like they're they're like cashing in on their own joke. Yeah. yeah. I love well, that. Like they're bad. I think they've done that five times already. <laughs> like they're bad, but on purpose. Yeah. yeah right. They actually, I, I almost said, got better. They got more entertaining. They got as more they entertaining went. as they went on. Yeah, that's yeah. what it is. Well, the <laughs> first one, I just the idea of it angered me. Right. <laughs> but then the rest. <laughs> were more entertaining right yeah. right uh, hearing gilbert godfrey say oh no it's turning into a nuke nato after the shark nato hits a power plant uh, you know i've never laughed so hard in my life because 
I was like mid gulp of ginger ale <laughs> and it was just like psh, everywhere <laughs> came out my nose like that's how you know it's a good movie okay? yeah like yeah. I'm not saying Sharknado's good but if a movie right. can entertain me you enough to time. laugh hard enough right. to the point where ginger ale comes out of my nose <laughs> you did your job well right but what if it wasn't ginger ale it would have hurt more. That would have been like really surprising and probably alarming. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, spaghetti. <laughs> Ooh, speaking of spaghetti, that sounds good. <laughs> All, All right. right. Well, with that. <laughs> well, with that. Um... So concludes episode 365 365 mm-hmm. we hope that all of you listening have a great summer yeah and, and summer. enjoy whatever we do in the meantime enjoy yeah whatever's mm-hmm. coming out there we got a lot of stuff but um just not the podcast for a little while yeah unfortunately, i but, feel yeah. like uh we should end on some sort of uh like all on the same page okay would, would you give a toast Sure. I know we're not all drinking and maybe our listeners are at work. Sure. But they can re-listen to this part because I feel like all of us together should be on the same page I'll as we like toast. step yeah. away from this episode. So here's the Slaughter film. Here's to <laughs> seven years of every single week talking about genre films that we love. <laughs> Horror, science fiction, fantasy action, pro wrestling, superheroes, <laughs> wrestling. video games, all those things that we love. And here's to all the fans because, again, I cannot fucking believe that you guys love to just hear a couple of dudes from your EPA gush about horror movies. Right. You guys make it make it possible. So thank you, thanks for that. And finally, here is to the armies and the navies and the battles they have won. Here's to America's colors, the colors that never run. May the wings of liberty never lose a feather. Well, there nice. you go. <laughs> Some big trouble in little China there. Yeah. yeah. Alright, well with that we're going to uh, apparently seek out some uh, spaghetti. <laughs> seek out uh, some spaghetti. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm going to continue to drink. Yes, that well, sounds great. Lo- long, long into the night. <laughs> I'm drinking right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, see you guys. Bye. <laughs> this episode of the Slaughter Film Podcast features the talents of Corey Carr, Forrest Taylor, and Rhiannon Pushtek. Produced and edited by Corey Carr. Music by Vanguard. And introduced by me, Ricky. 